actually. Uh, whoops, that's fine. Um, we have a lot of information to cover, and um, I just want to kind of, you know, reassure you in advance that uh, um, this is fun. Uh, you can learn everything that you need to learn. You uh, probably know already, and you'll find out more during this webinar that we have a lot of great resources that you're provided with during um, during the project. Um, you got a lot of support from the Watershed Council from me so um this is most people who do this project if you're new to it have a really a really good time actually and a lot of them get very very deeply into dragonflies and they start looking for dragonflies and damselflies not just um as part of this project but for you know in a lot of other places that they that they go to so i guess with that let's uh let's get started oh the other thing i want to mention is this so that chat box where tiffany was encouraging you to put uh your name and where you're from uh, that's also a really great place to put any questions that you may have. So we'll have a lot of opportunities to interact um, virtually and in person today. That's another good thing about the field session, you know, even though the weather is really cruddy, actually right now for dragonfly activity, that's another place that you can ask questions that may have come up during the training. And I also try to pause before I go on to a new topic and I try to kind of keep these things informal. So as questions come up, go ahead and type them into the chat box so that they don't leave your mind um, instead of just like waiting for a pause. And then I'll do my best to pause occasionally and say, hey, Tiffany, if any new questions come up, then I'll try to address as many of those as I can before we move on to, uh, to the next one. So I just want to encourage you to do that. So these are uh, just kind of the, the basic goals that we have here for you folks today. You're going to learn um, sort of the main elements of the ecology and life history of dragonflies and damselflies, or odinates, as they are also called. And a lot of this, you know, this isn't the entire story of dragonflies and damselflies. They're fascinating, complex insects, but this is kind of the most essential things that you folks need to know to be able to go out and be successful doing these surveys. You're also going to learn how to tell males from females, newly emerged, mature individual, different life stages, and recognize some different kinds of behaviors, because those are all things that you're going to be recording in the course of collecting data for the project. And it's kind of nice that we're starting, you know, we're just looking at sites that are in Multnomah County. So that means that you don't need to worry about learning how to recognize the hundreds and hundreds of species that we have uh, in North America. You don't even need to worry about learning to identify the 93 species that we have in, uh, in the state of Oregon. We, we've really got kind of a narrower focus here and that's a really good way to learn, you know? So you're gonna, you're gonna learn to recognize, especially this, the, the common species in the watershed. You're gonna see a lot of these, you know, again and again and again um, throughout the season as you visit your sites. You're gonna learn the key things to look for in order to be able to identify these creatures successfully. And then of course, we're gonna go through how to do the monitoring, uh, the monitoring protocol that we've developed, how do you do your reporting, what kinds of things do you look for? So you get all that information today. So hopefully that sounds interesting and exciting and all that good stuff. And so without further ado, let us meet the Odinates. I want to point out that uh, the photos that you're going to be seeing today, for the most part, are species that you would see in Multnomah County, definitely in the state of Oregon. It might be immature photos that you're seeing, it might be mature adults that you're seeing. And this is again, just to kind of get you um, familiarized with what some of these species look like. And you might even recognize some of these already from you know, walks you've taken at nature centers or even from dragonflies that might have, that might have visited your yard. So there are a lot of dragonfly and damselfly species in the world. We've got you know, over 500 in North America. So we have 93 species in Oregon. And right now the species list from Multnomah County and that species list is one of the resources that is available to you stands at 44 species. And when this project began, it stood at 39 species. So uh, in the course of doing the surveying, people that we're starting out from scratch, maybe with absolutely zero experience in dragonflies and damselflies. They learned enough about identification and doing this monitoring regularly year after year. We've actually been able to add new species to the list or provide photographs for species that only had, uh, you know, reports that were not accompanied by a specimen or by any kind of photographic proof. So um, this is actually pretty cool. And Tiffany, can I ask you, um, are you folks also seeing like the, I'm going to get rid of the display there. Um, are you, are you just seeing my slides or are I also seeing any of the zoom controls? We don't see any of the zoom controls. Oh, good. Okay. That's good. Um, it's just distracting me then. Um, and another thing that people oftentimes don't realize about, um, about dragonflies is that a lot of them are annual migrants. So if you ask somebody a question, oh, do you know of any insects 
that migrate pretty much if they come up with an answer at all, the only answer is going to be monarch butterflies. Well, in fact, there are several other species of butterflies that are migrants. And there are a lot of other kinds of insects that are actually pretty good migrants too. And in the case of some of these different kinds of dragonflies, the distance that they migrate in one particular cycle, you know, one complete annual cycle is actually a lot longer than the distance that monarch butterflies flies cover. And we have of those species that you see listed there, those common names, we have seen four of those five migratory species at one or more of the different sites that we monitor. The only one that we haven't found so far is the one called the wandering glider. Um, so we, we are also collecting data about this, this migration process, which um, if you think about how much is known about migration of monarch butterflies, there's not nearly as much known about migration in, um, in dragonflies. And it is just dragonflies that migrate. They've got the, the wing power. Damselflies are not, uh, not long distance migrants. So there's actually a lot of really important and useful information that this project has been garnering. And I, I just kind of like to tell people that up front because you know, anybody who's volunteering or participating in community-based science wants to know, well, you know, is this just, is this a, a meaningful exercise? Is it just the watershed council using this data? Is it being used by, you know, larger or different organizations? Is it important to science? And the answer to all those things is yes. Um, so that's one of the things that makes this kind of a cool project. So you're going to be finding yourself walking around in areas where there's a lot of water, right? And what you're going to be looking for is adult dragonflies and damselflies. And of course, those are terrestrial, right? They live on the land, but they're very closely tied to the water because they lay their eggs either in uh, on or very near to water. And the nymphs, the immature form, and you see a, a spread wing damselfly nymph there on the upper right, they are completely aquatic. And so even though the adults are winged, they can move around, they can migrate, they can certainly go a long distance over land, they're still tied to water because that's where they're gonna lay their eggs. That's where their young are going to be growing up. And one of the first questions that people have is how do I tell the difference between a dragonfly and you see one represented there by that beautiful cardinal meadowhawk, a species you're gonna see pretty frequently during your surveys, versus a damselfly, represented here by that gorgeous vivid dancer. And those are really, really abundant at um, our site that is located furthest east. It's not that difficult, is then you know what to look for. So dragonflies in general, as the name kind of implies, are larger, sturdier, stouter. They have a bigger body. Uh, their abdomen is wider. You know, a lot of damselflies have almost like a thread-like abdomen, so a broader abdomen on the dragonflies. And if you look at the head, um, it looks like it's just kind of bright red and shiny in front of the head of that meadowhawk. Well, those are the eyeballs, right? So dragonflies have gigantic eyes, and they're so big that they really occupy most of the space of the head and they're, they're kind of squished together um, for a lot of our different dragonflies or, or nearly touching. So very big eyes uh, dominating the head. And the other thing to look for is the shape of the wings and that meadowhawk has its wings spread out very nicely. And if you look at the hind wings, especially where they get closer to the abdomen to where they join the body, you can see that they're, they're wider from the front edge of the wing to the rear edge, from the leading to the trailing edge. And the front wings are a little bit narrower than the hind wings in comparison. And that, that characteristic actually gives this suborder dragonflies its name. So dragon and damselflies are both in the order Odonata, right? And they're two different suborders. And the name of the suborder for dragonflies is Anisoptera. And if you break that word down, it means unequal wings. And so that is reflected in the fact that dragonfly hind wings are broader than, dragon, uh, than the four wings are. And the other thing is that when they perch, they perch pretty much the way you see that meadowhawk. The wings are held uh, kind of parallel to the substrate or they're held out horizontally um, when they are perched. Damselflies do things a little bit differently as the name implies. Again, they are uh, smaller. Uh, generally, they are both shorter and more slender. Their eyes, when you look down on top of the head, they still have big eyes, but their head looks almost like, like a free weight, like a dumbbell. So you've got the slightly narrower part in the center and then the eyes are kind of bulging out on the side. And you can pretty much see that with that vivid dancer. And this critter is perched again with a, a wings held in a way that's very typical of damselflies, but it almost looks like one wing, right? They're, they have the same shape, the same outline. They have four wings total, just like a, a dragonfly does, but their wings are equally sized. And their name, Zygoptera, the official name of the suborder of damselflies, means like twin wing. And that refers to the fact that all four of their wings 
um, have the same length and the same width pretty much. And when they perch, as you can see here, they fold their wings together. They might hold them uh, slightly up above the level of the abdomen, like you see these dancers do. They might hold them um, slightly more compressed, uh, pressed up against the sides of the abdomen. And that's another way you can actually tell the difference between different types of damselflies. Now, I've got some cool videos in, uh, uh, here. Um, if you look at the video on the left, that is a dragonfly nymph. The one on the right is a damselfly nymph. And these are swimming around in petri dishes. And differences between the dragon and damsel adults are kind of mirrored in the nymphs as well. The nymph is bigger bodied, it's stout, it's kind of torpedo shaped, right? And if you look at this nymph who's doing its best here to get out of that petri dish, you can see that the water behind it is rippling. So I said that the, the nymph stage, the immature stage is aquatic. And if you live under the surface of the water, you've got to get some way to uh, extract oxygen from the water, right? So dragon and damselfly nymphs both have gills, but dragonflies have internal gill chambers and damselflies have external gill structures. So if we take a look again at this dragonfly nymph scooting around, you can see that the abdomen ends in sort of a point. What dragonflies do is they pull in water, which of course has dissolved oxygen in it, they pull it into their rectal gill chamber, okay? So basically they breathe using their butts. The convoluted tissue in that rectal gill chamber extracts the oxygen, and then they've got this deoxygenated water. So what's a good way for this kind of clumsy bodied critter to move around at high speeds? It shoots that deoxygenated water back out of its rear end and it propels itself very quickly in the opposite direction. So those ripples that you see in the water there, that's that deoxygenated water being shot out of that critter's rear end. It's trying to scoot away in the other direction. Now, whoops, let me go back one here. With the damselflies, you can see that the body is more slender. They kind of wiggle their abdomen when they swim a little bit like a fish. And you can also see that there are these little extensions. Ah, damn it, I was trying to hit pause. Technical difficulties. You can see that there are these sort of long, flat, thin, blade-like extensions at the tip of the abdomen. So those are gill structures. And if you took a very close look at them, it would look as if they were full of a very intricate network of veins. And those aren't actually veins, those are air tubes. Those are tubes that will take up oxygen. So you've got these, it's like additional body surface really that's exposed to the surface of the water. Oxygen can diffuse into all those fine little air holes, those air tunnels in the gills, and then it can go into their body. Insects have a, a very disseminated breathing system. They don't have central lungs uh, the way that we do, the way that mammals do. So uh, in both cases though, whether it's a dragon or a damselfly, those gills kind of double as not just a way to get oxygen out of the water, but a way to be able to swim or to move around in a very efficient way. They are also complete meat eaters. They are excellent predators. They are fast, they are strong, they have excellent eyesight. They're definitely very much uh, visual predators. And that's true of the immature stage. So they are aquatic predators. And it's also true of the adult stage. And actually that adult paddle tail darner there is munching. You can see at the front end of its head, it's caught what looks like a, uh, maybe a leaf hopper or a plant hopper, looks like some kind of a smaller soft bodied, soft bodied insect. But the mouth parts of a nymph versus an adult are a little bit different and it's really, really cool. So this video, which also has a voiceover, you'll play. This shows a dragonfly nymph, and it's in a tank with a There's bunch another kind of dragonfly of larva where larvae. the underlip has been modified to work as a couple of piercing hooks that grab the victim and take it to its mouth. The structure you see shooting out from underneath the head is essentially that dragonfly nymph's lower lip. It is on a hinge, so it can be folded away under the body when it's not in use. Oh, and there it's getting some, uh, it must have had kind of a low oxygen this environment. This instrument is so versatile, it can be to used to catch either mosquito larvae or fishes. Chamber. But when it goes to feed, it shoots out that lower lip. And I said these are strong predators. That little critter just caught a fish that's at least the size of the dragonfly nymph. And at the ends of that lower lip are these movable hooks. And the hooks have hooks. And the hooks on the hooks have barbs. You can see that right there, those sort of jaggedy edge jaws, and it's holding that fish in place. So that lower lip is a grabbing structure, it shoots out, nabs the prey, and very quickly brings it back to the chewing, ripping, tearing portions of the mouth. 
Now these are generalist predators. Certainly they can eat a lot of mosquito larvae if they're in a place where there's a lot of mosquito larvae. They'll eat other aquatic insects. They'll go after fish. They'll go after that tadpoles. That post skin is very slippery and the hunting larva fails its attack. That looks a little bit like a bullfrog tadpole, which was a little large for it to get its jaws around. Tadpole doesn't look too fussed. And it's just so fast. The way this the way this jaw shoots out and the name of the order odonata means toothed right having teeth and it's the teeth on the lower lip that labium as the official word is that gives this entire order its name so a really cool unique way of hunting now adults remember i said they have those big eyes they're visual predators but they don't have that extendable lower lip anymore they just have chewing mouth parts so what they have is sticky, hairy legs. And they swim around, they hold them in front of their body like a basket. We may think of lions and sharks among the most successful predators in nature, but lions and sharks catch about 50% of their prey at best. Dragonflies, on the other hand, catch up to 95% of their prey. What enables them to do this? Scientists have found from recording signals in the brain that they can focus on one object at a time, picking out their prey from a swarm of other insects. They have separate sets of muscles for four different wings. That means they can fly upside down, they can pivot 360 degrees, they can fly backwards, and they can fly 30 miles an hour. And they have among the best eyes of any creature in nature. A dragonfly is flying at you, it can see you as it's coming toward you and as it's going away, giving them the chance to escape even the quickest and most agile animals that want to eat them. I love the frog each time, like trying to fling that empty air into its uh, mouth. So some really important points there. Number one, Huge eyes, excellent eyesight. It makes it very hard to sneak up on a dragonfly or a damselfly. You'll learn that when you start to swing a net. They have almost a 360 degree visual field. And if you watch a perch dragonfly or a damselfly, you'll notice it constantly kind of moving its head around. So it moves its head, it's able to cover a whole lot more of that visual field. They're strong, fast flyers. And you saw some really good footage there when that dragonfly with the numbers on the wings was landing. All four of the wings could tilt and move and pivot and flap independently. That gives them not just strong flight, but really excellent control. They can jump up, they can fly backwards for short distances, and that, of course, also helps them to be really good predators because they can readjust their motion in really good visual processing system. So excellent predators as nymphs and adults. So really beneficial insects in that, in that sense. Now, like all insects, dragonflies and damselflies wear their skeletons on the exterior of their bodies, right? And that means that there's a limit to how big a nymph can get before it's literally kind of stuck inside of its skeleton. So these immature stages, these nymphs, they start as just tiny, tiny, tiny little creatures. And as they eat and grow and get bigger, at different individual stages, they actually have to shuck off that external skeleton. They have to shed their skin, which is called molting. And every individual stage between one of those molts, one of those skin sheds is called an instar. So nymphs will molt through multiple different stages or instars. And these creatures have what's called incomplete development. And that doesn't mean they don't turn into adults, obviously. It means that the immature form looks kind of like the adult form, but it doesn't have functional wings and it doesn't have functional genitalia. And of course, in the case of uh, this particular order, that mouth part gets rearranged from that extendable lower lip to just chewing, ripping, crushing jaws. So the older the nymph gets with each mold, these little tiny nubbins of wing pads start to develop. They get a little bigger and they get a little bigger until that nymph is ready to burst out as an adult from this final stage of being a nymph, this final skeleton. And it's a process that I never get tired of watching. It's fascinating, it's enthralling, it's entrancing. And you can tell a mature nymph that's ready to emerge as an adult because those wing buds, which you can see pretty well, kind of in the middle of the back of that uh, skimmer nymph on the left, get very, very puffy and swollen. It is at this stage this late nymph uh, stage, a mature nymph, ready to turn into an adult, 
that the insect actually stops breathing with its gills. It starts to bring, breathe atmospheric oxygen the way it will as an adult, and it leaves the water. That nymph that you see on the left and in the middle, that is not underwater anymore. It has crawled its way up the stem of some grass, and now the adult is literally going to burst out of the skin of that previous nymphal instar. And you see that process beginning in the middle there. So what you're seeing is that the skin, what you might think of sort of uh, between the shoulder blades, the exoskeleton, the external skeleton splits open. The insect has been gulping air to inflate the body of that ready to emerge adult. And the head and uh, legs and what will inflate into the wings is the first thing that's pulled out of that nymphal uh, skeleton. And then usually the insect will fling itself forward, grab on, sometimes onto its own skeleton there, other times onto the plant, then it yanks out its abdomen, and then it has to send its blood coursing through the veins in its wings in order to get those wings extended and inflated because they're tiny little crumpled things when it first comes out. And then it withdraws that fluid and pumps it out through its abdomen because the abdomen is also very short. This is an incredibly vulnerable stage for any dragon or damselfly. They are extremely soft, extremely squishy, and birds really, really love to come and eat them at this stage as well. So let's take a look at Sir David Attenborough showing and telling us about this also process. Been the home of another kind of insect with an equally ancient ancestry, and it too is beginning to emerge from the water. Bigger and more ferocious than the mayfly larvae, it has been feeding on tadpoles and even small fish. But that phase of its life is over. Now each one has to haul itself out of the water and into the air. On the top of its thorax, it carries a bulging backpack. You kind of see the body pattern of that adult's abdomen through the, the abdomen of the nymph. itself and its outer skin splits. A very different creature begins to appear. White threads are drawn out of its flanks. They are the linings of thin tubes that penetrate deep into its body, air tubes that will enable the insect to breathe. You see it swallowing air, inflating its body, helping it pull itself out. It's hard work. Grabs onto the surface with its legs, pulls out the abdomen. Those wings are tiny little crumpled things. It gulps air, inflating its body, forcing fluid into the bundle on its back. Its wings begin to unfurl. This is time lapse, of course. Ten minutes later, the wings open. They'll never close again. And I want you to think Next, look at the way those the huge appear. muscles within its thorax must be exercised to prepare them for action. They, they're shiny, but they're kind of dull. They don't look transparent. They're not and it's away. the way the wings of an, a mature dragonfly are. That's one of the best signs that you can see that will tell you that you're looking at a newly emerged adult. And the word for a newly emerged adult is a tenoral adult. And at that point, you really don't want to pick them up because you can end up damaging their wings, you can end up damaging their body. So those kind of cloudy, opaque looking wings is a dead giveaway for a dragon or a damselfly that you're looking at a newly emerged adult. So as I said, this tenoral newly emerged adult has a very soft, squishy body. It's gonna take time for the, the proteins in its exterior skeleton to kind of cross link and, and for it to harden up. It doesn't look the way a, a mature adult will look. It doesn't have the mature uh, pattern and colors that it will have as an adult. And it is not a very strong flyer yet. And in the video, you heard Attenborough say that it's, you know, as it shivered its wings, that it's got to kind of exercise them to build up its flight muscles. One of the reasons that dragonflies have such a big chunky thorax, the part of the body where the wings are attached, is there's a lot of muscles in there. And a lot of those muscles are flight muscles, right? Because they have these big strong wings and they have to be able to, to move them. So those have to be able to develop. And if you look from the upper right corner, that tenoral adult snake tail, to the lower left, that's, that's the immature versus the adult. And you see there's a, there's a, a lot of changes that are going to go on. 
So these immature forms are not yet ready to reproduce. They're not sexually mature. And they yet generally, uh, as I said, they're soft, they're squishy. Uh, birds and other predators like to eat them. Dragon and damselflies will play, prey on each other. There's a lot of cannibalism that can happen. So they're very vulnerable. And although they are not very strong flyers, once a dragon or damselfly emerges, the first thing it does as an adult is leave the water. It gets a little bit further away from the water body that it developed in, which might be a river or a lake or a pond, depending on what kind of dragonfly it is. They go away to where it's a little safer. They spend time feeding, maturing, developing that full mature adult coloration, coming to sexual maturity, and then they return to the water to patrol, to find mates, and to lay eggs. And as many of these uh, insects continue to age, and they only live for a few weeks as adults, in many different species, that color development is going to continue. So on the left-hand side here, you see a dragonfly that you'll probably see a lot of called a 12-spotted skimmer. And the, the reason for that common name is pretty evident. If you look at the lower photo, there are one, two, three black spots on each of its one, two, three, four wings, and three times four is 12, right? But if you look at the upper uh, photo, you can see some of those black spots, but they're really pale and they're really faint. And those wings still have that kind of cloudyish color, right? They're, they're not transparent and see-through the way the uncolored portion of the, of the mature individual's wings on the bottom are. And you can also see that the abdomen of the insect has developed this sort of powdery looking coating and that there are little white patches in between some of the black patches on those wings. And that's another type of color development that can happen, not in every type of dragon or damselfly, but in some. And that whitish powdery coating is called pruinosity. Um, and that's really, it's something that they secrete, the cells in their body secrete. And it's a lot like the, like the waxy coating or that powdery coloration on a, on a plum or on a grape. And not all species develop it, but when you see that, you know that's a mature individual. It's sexually mature, it may already have reproduced. The other thing to remember, and if you're familiar with birds, this won't come as a huge surprise, is that males and females of the same species can look pretty different. In many cases, it's just a difference in coloration. So you see a mature female dancer, uh, female vivid dancer on the top right, and a mature male vivid dancer on the bottom right. Now, if you look carefully at the pattern of color and black on the body, it's actually the same. Vivid dancers have these really cool arrowhead shaped markings down the sides of the abdomen, but the female is kind of powdery blue in front and a pinky tan on her abdomen, and the male is this gorgeous vivid indigo. So in some cases, it's just different in coloration, but the same pattern. But in other cases, males and females actually have totally different patterns to the point that you might think they're members of different species. And I'll point out some of those as we encounter them uh, as we continue. Tiffany, are there any questions before I go on to talk about mating and laying eggs that have popped up about any of what we've covered here already? I don't see anything right now. Maybe if folks have questions in this moment, they can put them in the chat box real quick. There's nothing that I'm seeing right now. Yeah. Um, and as I, as I said, I'll wait you know, a little bit for folks to type in any questions that they might have. As things occur to you, please do. Um, don't, you don't have to wait for me to pause to type them in. Type them in as they occur to you. I'll pause, ask Tiffany if there's any questions and we'll, we'll get those addressed. And if there is nothing coming in, I will go ahead and uh, move on through the life cycle. Yeah, I think you can move on for now. We'll, we'll just check in as other people type things in. One of the things that um, sometimes startles people that are new to looking at dragon or damselflies is that sometimes they will see this sort of weird heart-shaped or wheel-shaped tumble that appears to be made up of more than one dragon or damselfly, maybe perched on a tree, the way those common green darners are, or maybe uh, perched on shrubbery or foliage or on the surface of some floating vegetation, the way the tule bluets on the right are. And this has to do with the way that dragon and damselflies engage in copulation, in reproduction. So on the left, the dragonfly that's holding onto the tree, that's actually perched holding onto the tree with the green uh, thorax and the pale blue abdomen, that's the male. And the female, who's more green and brown, she's the one who is underneath. And on the right, with those tule bluets, the one that is straight up and down in the air, basically just holding on to the back of the female's head with his abdomen, beating his wings furiously, that's the male. 
and the female has her abdomen tucked up underneath, she's actually in the process of laying eggs. So when dragonflies and damselflies mate, the male uses structures at the very end of his abdomen to grab on to the female, either kind of right behind her, her eyes, um, which is the way dragonflies do it, or more sort of at the back of the head, which is the way damselflies do it. Dragonfly and damselfly males are a little bit funny in that they do not use, uh, they do not keep the organ that they use to transfer sperm to a female, the equivalent of, a, of the penis, right? They don't keep it in the same place as where they make the sperm that they're going to transfer. So sperm is produced uh, in organs at the end of the abdomen, at the tip of the abdomen, but that's not where their penis is. So when a male is ready to find a mate and engage in copulation, sometimes you might see a male, dragon or damselfly, usually more with the dragonflies, curving their abdomen up underneath their body. Like that's kind of a funny thing for them to do. What they're basically doing is charging up their penis. They are transferring that packet of sperm from the end of the abdomen where it's made to the actual sperm transfer organs, which are located um, on the underside of the third abdominal segment. With the bluets, with the damselflies, they're a little bit more flexible and they can actually engage in that transfer process in some cases after they've already grabbed onto the female. Now, if the female is willing uh, to engage, it's not automatic if a male grabs a female that she's gonna say, yeah, let's mate. If she's willing to engage, she will swing the end of her abdomen up to engage with the sperm transfer organ on the underside of the male's abdomen. And that's what you're seeing on the left. When dragon, dragonflies or damselflies are hooked together, this is called the wheel uh, formation because it looks a little bit like a, a rather lumpy wheel. They can fly that way. They can perch that way. It's a little bit clumsy. And this is when the actual mating process is happening. So they're said to be copulating at that point in time. Um, mating can take, you know, a few to, to many minutes, maybe to an hour or so, and generally the females are going to lay their eggs pretty soon after they mate. Now, every male dragonfly wants to mate as many times as possible, right? This is all about passing your DNA on to the next generation. And female dragon and damselflies can really get kind of hassled by the males. That's why they stay away from the water until they're actually ready to mate and lay their eggs. So in many cases, the male wants to be sure that he is the very last individual that mated with that particular female. And so there are different types of guarding behavior that these males use to protect uh, their, their, their uh, patrimony, as it were, to be sure that it's their sperm that gets used to fertilize that female's eggs. So when the females, oh, what, do we have a question, Tiffany? We had two questions that just came in. Okay. I don't want to take you too far off this path, but... Uh, Faith asks if dragonfly nymphs, when using their internal gill, is it the same hole that water goes in and out, or do they have an in and out hole? Oh, that's a really good question. No, it's not like mussels, right, that have an in-current siphon and an ex-current siphon. It's the same thing. So in that rectal chamber, the tissue there is like really, really folded up. Um, and that's just a way to increase surface area, like increase the number of cells available to pull out oxygen without having to have a really big structure, right? It's like how much space three yards of fabric takes up if it's stretched out versus if it's folded up really tightly. So they pull in the oxygenated water into that rectal gill chamber. The cells in the chamber extract the oxygen out of it. It starts to diffuse into the various breathing tubes into their body. And then through the same opening, they eject that, that spent, that deoxygenated water. So it's the same, it's the same opening. And it, you can see them sort of flexing it sometimes. If you catch a, a nymph and you put it in like a little cup of water, um, you can see it kind of opening and closing as it tries to, you know, cause it's stressed out as it's trying to get a little more oxygen and breathe more. Thanks for answering that, Celeste. And then we have one other question from Julie. Um, is prunosity more common in certain species or does it happen all across species with similar frequency? Another excellent question. It is definitely more common in certain species. And when we go through the identification, I'll point that out. Short answer is in one particular sort of grouping that, that is many species of dragonflies called the skimmers, the king skimmers. That's a group where there's a lot of this pruinosity uh, in the males, sometimes in some species in the female. So it's really common with them. 
and in a few different types of damselflies as well, especially the spread wings. The males tend to get this pruinosity, um, as well as in one particular adorable little stubby bodied type of, uh, of damselfly that you'll see pictures of, which is the, uh, the Western forktail. So um, it's definitely not just widespread across the boards. There are a lot of different hypotheses about, well, why is it that these particular kinds of dragonflies have pruinosity and these don't? Um, it's not used in courtship behaviors. There's really only one group of dragon of damselflies that appears to use color patterns to engage in courtship, and it's dark shading on the wings, and they clap their wings open and closed. Uh, that's the the jewel wings. So um, there's not really a definitely known function for the pruinosity, but it's a really good diagnostic feature for species identification because it is characteristic of just different subgroups um, of dragonflies and some damselflies. Good questions. Excellent questions. Great. That was all the all questions right. we had. Oh, one more. Nope, that was okay. it. Thank you for answering those. Okay. All right. So when the females go to lay their eggs, um, depending on the species, they might actually use their egg laying structure called the ovipositor and insert those eggs into plant material like the stems of rushes, for example. And sometimes you will see a pair of damselflies and the female is like working her way down the stem of a plant and she'll actually go underwater. And if you see this happening, you might see that the body of the female looks a little bit silvery. It has a bit of a reflective sheen. And that's just kind of a little, a little surrounding bubble of air. The body is sort of, of water repellent. And that means that she can stay underwater for an hour or more and oxygen will diffuse into that little airspace around her body. Now, when the female's underwater, and this is for the damselflies laying her egg in that way, the males are engaging in what is called contact guarding. And you see that on the lower right. It's a pair of sooty dancer damselflies. The female is perched sort of on the surface of the water. You can see her abdomen is tucked underneath. She's laying eggs. The male is still holding onto her um, behind the, the back of her head. And he's like perched there and he's keeping her upright. Now this means that no other male is gonna be able to come along and mate with her. And sometimes you'll see them dive bombing each other, you know, trying to scare away the attached male, yeah, right? But the thing is that little dude is very vulnerable. He can't really fly away. He doesn't wanna stop the female from laying eggs. That's been the whole purpose of this exercise. And he's sort of noticeable because a lot of the times he's moving his wings because he's trying to keep them moving or perched or steady. And it is not unusual that this will attract the attention of a bird who will swoop down and snip off the juicy front end of that damselfly. And it's not terribly unusual if you look at damselflies long enough that you might see a female flying around with just the, the, uh, the abdomen of the last male that she mated with stuck still to the back of her head. The poor male fell victim to a bird but hey, at least some of his, you know, his, his progeny will hopefully live on because he did manage to successfully mate. In the dragonfly world, this sort of contact guarding, remaining physically attached to the female as she lays her eggs is actually pretty uncommon, but common green darners, which you see uh, on a log there, the female again has got her tip of her abdomen pressed down to the surface of the wood. She's putting her eggs in there the male does continue holding on to the female. But in most other cases, the male releases the female, she lays her eggs, and depending on the species, as I said, they might be inserted in plants, they might be jabbed into sediment like mud, um, or they might just be laid in strings on or under the water, or they might be laid in soil at the edge of a wetland that will, that will flood uh, the following spring, and then those eggs will hatch. And the male doesn't just go away though. He's gonna continue circling, flying around that female, watching her as she lays her eggs. And if any other males come in and try to grab that female as she's flying along doing her egg laying business, they will charge at each other. And it's really fun to watch this because you can actually hear this sort of dry, uh, almost like a dry leaf rustling or this dry clattery sound. And that's their wings as they're trying to kind of body slam each other. Uh, the approaching male wants to get rid of the one protecting the female. The male who mated with the female wants to make sure that nobody else mates with her. Because here's the other thing about that that dragonfly penis, that damselfly penis, it doesn't just transfer sperm to the female. It's got hooks and brushes. It's like a little multi-tool. And so males, when they mate, can actually either shove to the side or completely scoop out the sperm packet 
of any male that might have made it with that female before he did. So if another male comes in and mates, the previous male's DNA may not be passed on at all. So this guarding behavior can get really, really intense. There could be a lot of midair clashing and collisions. Okay, that brings us kind of from, uh, from egg to adult. That is most definitely not absolutely all of the details as far as dragonfly life history. There's a, there's a lot of cool stuff that I uh, kind of chose to prune out a little bit um, for the sake of time. But if you have any questions about dragonfly or damselfly life history, habitat, hunting, reproduction, development, now is a good time to ask those. No? Nothing so far, but we can always uh, I'll give you an update. Wait, I got something that just came in. Um, yeah, okay. Faith just asked, how many times will a, will a female or male uh, lay their eggs in a life cycle? So males yeah. generally mate multiple times. So one thing you remember too is that uh, I, dragonflies and damselflies spend the majority of their entire life from egg to adult to dead in that immature nymph stage. So they're only on the wing for a couple of weeks. And that means that the reproduction behavior is really, really important. So once you get a mature adult, it is all about mating. It is all about laying eggs, right? So males generally will mate multiple times. A female may mate one or two times, but generally speaking, once there has been a successful mating for the female and she lays her eggs, so that she uses that sperm and as the eggs pass through her, her oviduct, the eggs are then fertilized with that sperm. She gets less receptive to being grabbed by a male again. So remember I said, she's gotta cooperate once she gets grabbed, right? The male grabs her behind the eyes or behind the head. If she doesn't swing her abdomen up to engage, um, no mating is gonna happen. So the females generally don't mate very, very many times because um, they become less receptive to the approach of a male. That's great. Um, and I also had a quick question. So if you see dragonflies or damselflies engaging in mating behavior, should you avoid capture at this point for the proliferation of their species? You know, we don't want to like prevent it. Yeah, that's my question. Yeah, that's a very good question. So here's the thing. Um, that is an excellent question to ask. And we always want to think when we do, you know, like hands on monitoring, are we actually inflicting any harm, right? On the individuals, on the species, absolutely. But for this particular case, all of the different species that we would be finding, um, and that's you know, gonna be true for almost any of the ones, pretty much every, every, every species that we will encounter at any of these sites, they are common, they are widespread, and they are abundant, so. If you get a net on a mating pair of males and females, or even a, a pair that's laying their eggs, um, you're not harming them because like you haven't broken any of their bodily structures, for example, they're not attached in quite that way. One of the first things that will generally happen when you do swing that net, if you capture a mating pair, is that they just let go of each other because now they, they're thinking they want to escape, right? So you've interrupted mating, um, but you're not harming the individuals. When you release them, they can resume mating, the male or female might find, you know, a different, a different mate. And it's actually kind of a pretty good learning experience because remember I said that males and females can look really different from each other. And if you're not sure about like, oh, this female, what species is it? Capturing a mating pair or a tandem pair, uh, a pair that's still attached to each other, but not actually engaged in sperm transfer. It's a really good way to figure out what the male and female of the same species look like. Two exceptions to this. Sometimes when you swing your net and you're by the edge of a wetland or something and you capture a female, if she is a female that was ready to lay her eggs or kind of in the process of laying her eggs, you might notice as you pick her up out of the net that suddenly these eggs start to spill forth from the end of her abdomen. This is kind of a save the babies emergency response, right? She's just been grabbed. She figures she's going to be eaten. Oh my God, I need to offload my eggs. I need to make sure that somebody survives. If that happens, whenever I catch a female, even if it's kind of a common species, 
and I see her start to extrude those eggs, I let go of her pretty quickly so that she can fly away and wash those eggs off in the water or, you know, put tap them against the, the mud or the soil. Um, so in that case, I'll release an egg heavy female pretty quickly. And then the one way that you will do damage is if you swing your net and you are grabbing one of those tenoral dragon or damselflies, those newly emerged ones, they're really soft, they're really squishy, their wings are very fragile. And even if you're handling it correctly, and we'll talk about how to handle a netted dragon or damselfly correctly, you are very, very likely to do it physical harm from which it will not recover. And honestly, especially with damselflies, getting it in the hand and looking at it when it's really, really newly emerged, it's not gonna have enough of the features developed yet for you to really even be able to identify it anyhow necessarily. So it's not, it's not worth netting the tenorals. Um, and sometimes it happens by accident, maybe usually more with the dragonflies, you maybe don't realize that it's a little bit immature. Um, once there's been some color development, it's probably safe enough to grab it and hold it. But when they've got those, those sort of opaque soap bubble looking wings that haven't quite hardened up and dark and, cleared up yet that's a good time to avoid netting or handling it but otherwise um you know it's funny if you think about the way people describe dragonflies or you think about poems that talk about dragonflies there's a lot of imagery that's that's like gossamer and delicate it's like these things can migrate right those migratory species they can migrate thousands of miles they are strong tough flyers so while those wings may, may look you know, delicate, fragile, these are fairly sturdy creatures and it's not hard to handle them safely. Now, one thing to keep in mind is the wing tissue cannot heal. It can't regenerate. And maybe you've seen a dragonfly that has like one of its wings gone or part of a, ring, a wing ripped off, like maybe it escaped from a bird or something that was trying to eat it. That wing won't heal, it won't regenerate. So you do wanna be careful about handling them. If you rip or tear or crack a wing, it's just gonna be that way until that dragonfly dies. But by the same token, if you just know a few, uh, a few different uh, specifics about how to get a dragonfly or a damsel out of a net, how to hold it, how to look at it, how to let it go, um, you really won't do them any harm at all. And we'll talk more about that too when we talk about the actual monitoring. That help? Yes, that makes sense. Um, one other kind of related question is, do mating pairs ever mate interspecies or they always latch onto their own species? That was a question from Julie. That's a good question. So it is possible to make mistakes. And I have seen various different photos that people have captured of two different males grabbing each other, um, a sort of daisy chain that develops where there's a male and a female and another male came in and grabbed the male or tried to grab the female on a different part of the body. Um, sometimes there are some mismatches that happen. Generally speaking, generally speaking, if it's an, a mismatched pair of species, either the female will not be particularly receptive or um, I mentioned that, you know, the males and the males hold the females either behind the eyes or in the back of the head. There are actually different little uh, like depressions and pegs and sculpting of the female's uh, external skeleton in that area. That's, it's not quite a lock and key fit, but it, it is definitely a, oh yeah, I fit you, you fit me, we were meant to be together. So actual final successful copulations, although there can be some cases for some species of some interbreeding are pretty rare. Um, but if you look at dragonflies long enough, you might see one of these funky little, funky little threesomes or funky little mismatching. They usually don't last long. They generally don't go to completion. Great, thank you for answering that. Um, let's see. Okay, one last question before we move on. With a two week life cycle, how long is spent in each stage of life? That was from Faith. So depending on the species, dragonfly or damselfly nymphs can spend anywhere from one to more than five years as a nymph, right? And um, they will molt through, again, a number of different instars. It might be 10, it might be 12, that varies with species. So definitely it's that nymphal stage that is the longest one. And like I said, depending on species, it could be years that they spend in that nymphal stage, or it might be, you know, multiple months to a year. With the adults, 
Um, as I said, generally, it's a matter of a few weeks as an adult. So that's why they're really, really focused on feeding and mating. In some cases, and this oftentimes happens with more tropical species, adults might emerge in the lowland area, fly up into the highlands and sort of become, they're not really quite hibernating, but they're being inactive. They're waiting until the rains come again. They're waiting until conditions are good for them to return to the water and mate and lay their eggs. But with more of our North American species and certainly the ones that you're going to encounter, it's you know a few weeks at the most on the wing as adults. Um, months to years as nymphs, depending on species. Great, thanks Celeste, that's all the questions. Great, okay. All right, so that was a quick jog through life history. Um, we're gonna talk about identification next, but I wanna point out to you some of the resources that you may have already received links for from Tiffany. If not, you will be getting those um, in hard copy, I think for some of them, and they'll be available as PDFs. So we have some resources that are specific that have been developed just for this project. And on the left, you see the cover page of a, oh, it was like a 15, 20 page manual that is all the complete detailed directions for you as surveyors to do dragonfly and damselfly monitoring. And as we have uh, developed and refined these resources over the years, I said we're in year six now of this project, every year at the end of the season, we ask you folks, we ask the volunteers for feedback. What worked for you? What didn't work for you? What were some challenges that like we could provide resources to help you overcome? So definitely I've done editing and revisions of this dragonfly and damselfly monitoring manual, if you want to think it that way. And every different aspect of monitoring is going to be addressed in there. So that is absolutely a resource that we want you to take a very close look at. On the right, on this slide, you see uh, the first page of a, it's just like a three or four page sort of pamphlet, I guess you could call it, three or four page handout. <clears throat> and it is a quick guide to the families of dragonflies and damselflies. Now you're gonna see some of those different families. So like spreadwing is one family of damselfly. Skimmer or meadowhawk, those are different families of dragonflies. And after the first or second year of the project, one of the volunteers said, you know, I feel like I spend a long time when I'm trying to identify something, just flipping through page after page in my field guide, because I don't know which family to go to right away. And I thought, oh yeah, that's a really valid kind of, kind of statement. So we put together this quick guide to families that will first of all help you separate into, am I looking at a dragonfly or a damselfly? And then from there, some different sorts of characteristics that will help you zero in on, oh, it's a skimmer, it's a meadowhawk, it's a spread wing, it's a dancer, it's a bluet. And then that lets you know, oh, now I can go right to the section of my field guide or to my app and figure out exactly what the species is. So two, two resources that I very strongly urge you to become extremely familiar with. And as always, of course, we you know, welcome feedback on these, how to make them more detailed or useful or user-friendly for sure. And then regional. So there are two different books that might be of interest to you. One of them is for uh, dragons and damsels of the entire West. So this is Western, uh, Western North America. So this is Dennis Paulson's Dragon and Damselflies of the West. It is a somewhat chunkier book. It is certainly extremely detailed. And the nice thing about these field guides is that they also give um, kind of a, a summary of all this different life history and mating and over position stuff that I, that I just talked to you about. It's, a, it's an excellent book. If you think that you're going to get deeply into dragon flying, um, I would certainly urge you to get it. But I also know that for people that are just starting out, they kind of don't necessarily want a book that's gonna show them a whole lot of species that may not actually be ones that are in their area, right? So if you wanna narrow it in a little more tightly, there's another extremely excellent field guide, which is Dragonflies and Damselflies of Oregon, right? So the layout is a little bit similar. You know, all of them will have the distributions. And so you, like for the Oregon one, you can even see like, oh yeah, this is definitely in my county. This is definitely in the Willamette Valley. Oh, no, 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 that's one that you'd only find in the, in the Eastern part of the state. Both of them have very clear text, great diagrams, great photos, great illustrations. They're both available in paperback. They're both currently in print. You can get a hold of used or new copies of them for 
oh, I think anywhere from, you know, probably 15 to 45 bucks, depending on if it's used or new, you can get them through Powell's, um, you, can, you can buy them online. Um, so these are books that you might want to take a look at. Very, very good regional guides. And then the other thing that I could point you towards, uh, if you want to get more involved, if you want to learn more about dragonflies, if you want to go to meetings where a whole bunch of people basically go outside and hunt for dragon and damselflies, uh, the professional society um, for this particular group of insects is the Dragonfly Society of the Americas, or DSA, which is our abbreviation. We have a quarterly publication uh, called Argia that is available as a digital publication only. I was the editor of that for you know, four or five years uh, until I handed over the reins last year. Um, one of the things in the time of COVID that we started doing is this virtual lecture series that started in May of this year. So it's a really good educational organization. And there are different regional branches. So there's the Northwest branch, the Southeast branch, and in the before times, you know, we would have meetings, right? There'd be a big annual meeting and we would rotate the region it was in every year. We've been up in Canada, we've been down in Costa Rica. Um, now, of course, we had that was suspended because of COVID. But if, if they're in our area, if you, you, know, you don't mind traveling, we do it cheap. There's a minimal registration fee of like 30 bucks to pay for like potluck food and room usage at hotels. And you are out in the field with the people who wrote those field guides with the people who do research on these organisms. It's fun. It's a great learning experience. It's a chance to pull leeches off your feet in beautiful boreal bogs in Minnesota, you know, whatever types of things you enjoy. So maybe check out the Dragonfly Society of the Americas. And a lot of good, a good resources and educational tools as well. And then a related part of that is a website called Odinata Central. So this was developed many years ago now by uh, an Odinate scientist called John Abbott. And it was one of the first kind of citizen science platforms, really, um, that was launched out there well before, you know, things like iNaturalist and such were around. The goal of Open Not Essential is to map the distribution of all dragon and damselfly species in the new world. And this can be a very useful tool for you. And you can register, uh, get an account, free account at Odin Auto Central, and you can report your findings too if you want to. So what you can see is that, you know, maybe you want to see every different place in the state of Oregon where river jewel wings, river jewel wing damsels were found. So you can go to the website, you can search based on species, you could search all of North America. You could look just at the state of Oregon. And so here you can see that every little green dot on that map is showing you where a record was reported to Odin out of central of the Western Forktail, one of the species that you were very likely to see at most, if not all of your sites. Or you could just zero in on Multnomah County or Jackson County or, or Washington County, you know, whatever it is. You can click on the record. You can see the photos that were submitted. There are lots of big photo galleries here if you want to say, oh, I don't remember, what does a female Thule bluet look like? Well, I'm going to go to Odin out of Central. I'm going to look at all the Thule bluet records and I'm going to see, you know, because these records are vetted by, um, by experienced odontologists and some of them are make their living studying dragon and damselflies. Some are just very, very skilled folks who do entirely different things for a living. Um, and so they look at the records. And if you think you found a Western fork tail and you post that record, uh, they'll look at it and say, yep, that's what that is. This now goes into the database as an official Western fork tail record. And this, these, this is where the distribution maps for species in those field guides come from. So a very real world practical application of, uh, you know, of how this kind of community science can be used for the for the greater good. So check out Odin Auto Central. And there is a brand new app for that as well that you can use to report findings in the field. There are Facebook pages for both Dragonfly Society of the Americas and for Western Odinata, so uh, just the Western states. These are, these are very friendly, welcoming groups. It's a good way to stay updated on things like meetings and such, but um, a lot of people, especially you know, in the Western Odinata Facebook group, if you do Facebook, they'll post photos of, you know, that they took on a walk around a lake or when they were camping or fishing by a river. And, um, you know, as long as you're careful to post like what county you were in and what date it was, you can get not just identification, 
but like little little mini reports of why it's this type of darner and not that type of darner and what to look for to really specifically know that it's you know a female paddle tail darner versus a female shadow darner i mean i have notes that i've written into my own field guides based on these conversations that have come up on the western ode not a facebook page so it's a really really good resource and very friendly to newbies very friendly to newbies nobody's going to say oh that's stupid who wouldn't know what a common white tail looked like what are you doing here really friendly, really welcoming. Because I know sometimes newcomers can be shy. And one of the things that we're doing, uh, because we couldn't have a meeting in person this year, is the Oat Olympics. And we're doing it in June and December because it is the Dragonfly Society of the Americas. And so that includes uh, Central America. And uh, throughout the month of June, you can either report your findings directly to Odinata Central or to the Ode Olympics Project on iNaturalist, and we'll talk about iNaturalist in a few minutes. Um, and it's just trying to get an idea of, in the month of June, what all do we see from you know, the northern parts of Canada all the way down through Mexico. Um, so it's kind of a fun thing since we can't get together and go out in the field. But you could also uh, submit your findings to the Ode Olympics for the remainder of this month. And then finally, last but not least, <clears throat> There is a free app. The latest version of this was just released um, like a, a month or so ago called Dragonfly ID. And you notice that the, the developer of this is birds in the hand. So this was actually developed by the same people that have done a lot of the e-birding types of apps. If you've used any of those, you'll be very familiar with the way the layout is. So it's free. It can be downloaded on the iOS or the Android platforms. And it's got a few different ways to be able to use it. Um, it has a lot of just descriptions and information about the species, the seasons where it's been found, the months where it's been found in various different areas, many, many different photos. You also have kind of a quick ID tool. Um, you see that on the right, where you can say, well, I don't really know what I'm looking at, but you can put in what type of habitat it is. And there's little icons. Oh, it's forested. It's a river. It's a, it's a wetland. What are the main colors? Oh, it's green and blue. No, it's kind of tan. And it will look at all the different species that fit that description and those habitats in your area, come up with a list of possibilities. So um, you could also find hot spots and what's been reported in your county or in the, at that site you know, for different months. So very useful. And a lot of people immediately want to reach for their phone. They want that app for identification. Check out Dragonfly ID. OK. Um, you know what, Tiffany, we're a teeny bit ahead of schedule. This might be a good place to do a little bit of a break before we start in so that we can just do Odinate identification as a single unit. Does that sound okay? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. We've been on since nine, give people a moment to get a snack, do whatever. What do you think about coming back here at, um, how, what do you think, 1030? Is that okay? Um, do you want a little bit less time, 1020? Yeah, 1020. How about 1020? Let's do 1020. Okay, cool. All right, so we'll be back here then. All right, and if you have any questions that occur to you, type them into the chat box. We can deal with them when we get started again. See you at 1020.
Hmm. Let's see, Tiffany, are you still seeing my screen? I'm getting a message that um, the host has stopped video. Oh, let me change something. I think I turn yours off on the break. Um, it's okay if people don't see me. I don't mind. Well, I mean, no, I mean, I think it's great to see you. So I'm gonna just fix that. Give me a second. Okay. <laughs> At least I'm not muted now, so that's good. Oops. Yep, this should help. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, in that case, uh, let's get started with ODA identification, unless there are any questions that popped up. No, right. we didn't have any. Okay. So <clears throat> you're going to be learning the basics in the next uh, however long uh, for the major groups and species that uh, you are likely to be seeing. Okay. And this is not taken at once. Um, and identification is usually the part that that volunteers get really, really anxious about, right? Don't want to get it wrong. And how do I know if I've got it right? I don't want to say it if it's the wrong thing. But it's all just a learning process, you know? And the good thing is that the way the project is designed, that even if you don't necessarily know what species you're looking at, or if you identify it and it's wrong, there are ways to correct that. One of the wonders of, you know, photography and the way that you'll be posting your record. So that's one thing. The other thing is you got really good resources and you probably haven't had a chance to really explore those yet, but trust me, there are really good resources out there. <clears throat> and the other thing is one of the best ways to get started, um, whether it's with a, a plants or birds or mammals or you know beetles or dragonflies and damselflies is just to get to know the common stuff that's right around you because that way even if you don't know something that you're looking at you might think to yourself well i don't think i've ever seen that before it's something different you know and that's actually one of the ways that we have added not just new species to the project list in the last in the last five years but also a couple of new species to the county list. And it wasn't that the volunteers that were chasing after these dragonflies knew what they were looking at, but they knew that it didn't look like what they had been seeing the rest of the summer or what they had maybe been brushing up on for this is the species list that I would expect to see. So, you know, getting to know the common species, getting to be familiar with those, and then you'll be a lot better able to, you know, not just maybe start to identify things even on the wing, right, as opposed to in the hand or, you know, from a good photo, but to say, that just looks a little bit different. I'm going to run after that with my net. I'm going to chase after it until I can get a good photograph. And that's, that's a really useful way that we've gotten new data for the project. So, one of the things I kind of, you know, maybe want you to focus on a little bit as we go through all these different groups and species isn't just like here's exactly the checklist that you need to know to tell if you're looking at a liar tip spread wing or that you're looking at a four spotted skimmer it's what parts of the insect do i need to look at in order to be able to figure out from my book from my app from the online resources what genus or what species i'm looking at and that can be kind of having those tools uh, in your toolbox as opposed to, oh, I must just memorize a whole bunch of stuff and then I'll know what species I'm looking at. It's a more practical and some more effective way um, of going about identification. So I hope, I hope that makes sense, kind of the difference between those two approaches. But it is true that if you want to identify these creatures, you're going to need to learn a little bit of terminology because they're put together a little bit differently than other kinds of animals that you might be a bit more familiar with. So uh, this particular dragonfly, it was just a good perch, uh, a good shot that I got that lets me uh, show the different features. Um, it's not actually a species that you'd see around here. This is a four spotted pennant. I got a picture of that when I was in Texas, but it's, it's a good way to just illustrate the different body parts. And these are also things that you're going to see referred to when you look at species descriptions in your field guide. So you need to kind of get familiar with uh, with the body plan of a dragonfly or damselfly. And I'm using a dragonfly here as an illustration, but unless I show you both dragon and damselflies to show that there's differences, um, just assume that it's the same for both, right? So all insects have three body parts and six legs, right? That's a basic body plan for any adult insect. The three body parts are shown here. You've got the head, it's pretty, pretty obvious. And of course, that's where the eyes 
and the antennae and dragonflies and damselflies just have little tiny thread-like antennae. They're very, very easy to overlook. You can just barely see them in that picture. It's where the mouth parts are. And of course the eyes and the mouth parts are really important for dragon and damselflies um, where the various sensory organs are. The thorax, um, that is where each of the three pairs of legs is attached to the body. And it's also where the two pairs of wings are attached to the body. And I know you're gonna look at this photo or you're gonna say, I don't see six legs. I only see four legs. I only see two pairs of legs. All insects have three body parts and six legs. What's going on here? Dragonflies and damselflies are not big on walking. They do not like to take a stroll. They are flyers and they are perchers. And for some reason, maybe it's just for perch stability, it is not uncommon, especially for a dragonfly, when you see it perched on a twig or a tree trunk or whatnot, that it's only holding on with the second and third pair of legs. And it's a little hard to see in this photo because the, the overall color scheme of this dragon is, is very dark, but he actually has the first pair of his legs tucked up kind of behind the, behind the sides of his head. Um, so trust me, it really does have six legs, just like any insect would have. It hasn't lost them, they're not missing. But that's just sort of a pose that some dragonflies will strike when they're, when they're perching. So the thorax has the legs attached, it has the wings attached. <clears throat> it oftentimes will have various different types of stripes or markings on it that are very, very useful to identify the species. And then the rest of the body is this long abdomen, right? And it, it can be a little difficult to count up the segments, but the abdomen uh, of a dragon or damselfly contains 10 individual segments. And you can kind of see that there are little, uh, little demarcating lines. You can sort of see where each of the different segments is. And for me, I usually find it easiest to start at the end of the abdomen, because I know that's segment number 10 and count my way backwards. And again, the color, the pattern, the markings on a lot of those different abdominal segments, really, really useful for identifying the species. And then you're also going to be looking at some of those segments to figure out if you're looking at a male or if you're looking at a female. So let's zoom in a little bit more on, there we go, on this. So starting again with the face, moving back to the end of the abdomen. So I already mentioned you got this little thread-like antennae on the, on the head. The coloration on the front of the face in some cases is an important thing to look at to identify the species. So there's the front half kind of underneath where the eyes are, right? That's the, the rest of the face. And then of course there are these big compound eyes. And sometimes the color of those eyes can actually be helpful for identification. So some things to look at on the face, right? I already mentioned you might have stripes or markings on the thorax, but let's take a closer look at these wings, right? This species is called the four-spotted pennant. Pretty obvious why, it's got four dark spots on the wings. Some dragon or damselfly species have completely clear wings, uh, no markings or colors on them at all. Some of them have coloration uh, like in the veins at the front end, at the leading edge of the, of the wings. Others might have uh, reddish or brownish or blackish markings in various different parts of the wings. Some of them have that bright white pruinosity. Wing pattern can be a really useful thing for identification. And then there's another part of the wing that you might wanna take a look at. And if you look at where the label is that says pterostigma, that's just a fancy word that translates into wing spot. And a lot of times people just refer to it as the stigma. So this is a small kind of rectangular shaped uh, cell, a little rectangular shaped thing is enclosed by, by wing veins. It's fluid filled. It's thought that it, it, it's located close to the tips of, of the front wings. It's thought that it probably acts as some kind of a weighting mechanism to help uh, protect the wing structure, maybe keep the wing tips from tearing when the dragonfly is flying. But a useful thing for us when it comes to identification is that oftentimes it will have a variety of different colors and that can be characteristic for the different species that you're looking at. So looking at the stigma on the wings can be useful. And then the notice, that's just a part of the wing structure. You can see where that front wing, the one that's closest to, the, uh, to you, um, it looks like the wing sort of swoops out and then there's a little kink before you go on to the, the edge of the wing. That little kink or inflection point is just called the notice. And sometimes markings on a wing might be referred to as before the notice or after the notice. So it's just a part of the wing to know about. Of course, there's, there's two pairs of wings, uh, the front wings and the hind wings, or the fore wings and the hind wings. And so um, just know the difference between those. And then we get to the abdomen. So I didn't label every single one of the 10 abdominal segments. Uh, and these are oftentimes abbreviated as S 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. S is for segment, right? So it's the abdominal segment. And I have two of them highlighted there in red. So S10 at the very end of the abdomen I have highlighted because that's where the terminal structures are for uh, males and females. And those in females would be structures associated with egg laying and males it's structures associated with holding on to that female and the shape and location and size of those can oftentimes be useful in identifying to species. And then S2, segment number two, is also highlighted in red here. And that is because in the males, that is where that sperm transfer organ is located. And it's a little small on this dude, but you almost see like a little hook or a little barb coming down right at the tip of the arrow. So that is that flexible structure that it uses. It'll load that up with sperm from a producer at the tip of the abdomen. That is the organ that transfers the sperm to the female. That's the part of the body that the female will swing up and engage her genitalia, located at the end of her abdomen, S10, in order to be able to mate. So looking at that part of the body on a dragon or a damselfly is a really good way to tell if you're looking at a male or a female, because the female won't have that little nubbin, that little barb, her, her outline, uh, if you will, will be much more smooth and regular there. So a few different parts to look out for. Dang it. So for some reason, let me see. All right, sorry about this. Um, for some reason, recently, some of my um, some of my photos that I imported aren't showing up, and that seems to be the case with these that I uh, took out of a book. So sorry, I'm going to get out of. Um, uh, there we go. Oh my God, that's interesting. Sorry, let me fool with this for a sec. Sorry about that. Uh, all right, so apparently it didn't like me turning off the presenter notes. Blah. There we go, sorry about that. So it'll be a little bit harder to see. It won't quite fill your screen, but um, at least you can actually see the diagrams, which are sort of important. Oh my God, it's a size thing, okay. So those terminal appendages that are located at the tip of the abdomen, if we are looking at males and the upper part here shows what they look like in a dragonfly, the lower one shows what they look like in a damselfly, a little bit different, although they serve pretty much the same function. Um, you have these longer upper structures that are called circi, singular would be cercus, C-E-R-C-U-S. And again, those can be diagnostic for species. And that might seem like we're really getting into the weeds on the details here, but you're going to see in some of the photos that I'll show you in just a few minutes that is actually pretty obvious or evident. Oh my gosh, look at those Cersei. They've got a hook, they've got a fork, they're curved, they're blade like. Um, it's a pretty useful feature and not terribly hard to see. And then they have a lower structure in the dragonfly, it's called an epiproct. And in the damselflies, it's a little bit different. Uh, they have the pair of Cersei uh, on the upper section, and then they have have uh, the paraprox, um, a pair of those on the lower. So those can be structures that you can sometimes see in a photograph. Uh, sometimes you might need to get that critter in a net, take a look at it in hand with a magnifying lens or take a good photo of it. The females, of course, are going to have slightly different structures because what you have at the, at the tip of their abdomen is a little bit more uh, associated with laying eggs. So again, dragonfly at the top, damselfly in the lower portion. You can see that it's a little chunkier. Um, and oftentimes females do tend to have chunkier abdomens because they're the ones laying the eggs. And a female dragon or damselfly can lay hundreds of eggs and it takes up space. Those big ovaries in their abdomen take up space. So they can actually have broader abdomens than males do because they're full of eggs, right? Especially if they're ready uh, to lay those eggs, if they're mature females. So oftentimes you'll see a sort of a swelling um, with maybe a hook or a spiny type of structure. You especially see that in species that inject their eggs into plant material. Sometimes it'll be more sort of a little raised plate if it's a species that lays her eggs by uh, extruding them and washing them off in the water or just tapping them you know, against a muddy bank or a muddy surface, but it's, it's gonna look very different um, from the way uh, the male structures would look. All right, let me see if I can go back to the slideshow and have my photo show up. Yeah, sorry about that. That's a funky little thing that Zoom is doing to me. So we're gonna start with the dragonflies. 
And there are a lot of different types. Um, some of these you may you be very unlikely to see at your sites, others you're gonna see all the time. And so the general groups, and this usually reflects the families, we have darners and skimmers, emeralds and cruisers, club tails, spike tails, and petal tails, all right? So breaking those down a little bit, we'll start with the darners. Darners are the largest, generally speaking, uh, just physical size of the dragonflies. So you're going to see, although some darners are bigger and some darners are smaller, the family name is given in parentheses after the common name. So these are called the Eshnidae, uh, the Eshnidae. And there are a few different types, a few different styles, a few different genera. So there are green darners, and that's the genus Anax, what are called mosaic darners, genus Eshna and neotropical darners, which is Ryan Eshna. So I said these are large. Um, they're colorful, but not usually super bright colors. They're patterned in blues and pale greens and sometimes yellowish colors and darker brown, sometimes almost a uh, brown so dark that it's black. And these have the classic gigantic eyes dominating the face that, that meet there. It's almost like they're squished together and there's a seam on the top of the head where they're actually physically touch each other. So those are all characteristics of any of the different darners. Common green darner, I said, is one of our migratory species. So we don't know everything there is to know about the migrants, but what we, what we do know about common green darner, um, probably variegated meadowhawk and many of the other migratory species, is that adults will tend to fly south in the fall. Uh, oftentimes in September, if you're on the coast, you might be lucky enough to see a big flight of variegated meadowhawks or a big flight of common green darners that heading down south. We know that both in the east and the west, um, they do go as far south as Mexico. Uh, we know that in the east, they go as far south as Veracruz in Mexico, which is getting pretty far south uh, in the east. They probably go farther. We don't necessarily know where they spend the winter. Um, it is very likely that the generation that flies down in the fall is not the same generation that comes back up in the spring. If I reproduce down there, and that generation flies back up. But one of the things that means is that when springtime comes, common green darners and, and black saddlebags and variegated meadowhawks, those migratory species in our area, are gonna be some of the earliest winged adult dragonflies that we see. Because all of our other species that just hibernate through the winter here as nymphs, um, they're just waking up and starting to feed and starting to mold. Um, so we'll see these fairly early in the season. And then mapping you know, the timing of this, this moving front, basically, of the return of the migrants, um, this is something we're still filling in. We don't know like the exact date span that you could expect to see them. And of course, it depends on weather and habitat and things like that. Oh, real quick, Celeste, we have a question from yes. Celia. I think that Celia is asking a question about this species, so I wanted to interrupt them. They asked, uh, do they have shorter wings, this particular species? I think that's what she was asking. Shorter wings for the, the common wings. Yeah, the ones that we're looking at right now are within the last slide or two. No, not necessarily. Um, in fact, one of the characteristics of the migratory species is that, you know, I said dragonflies, the hind wings are broader than the front wings. In the migratory species, that's actually especially pronounced um, because it, so it might be that the wings look a little shorter because they're broader, so they might look a little less long than they are wide. So they're not shorter, but they are wider from front edge to rear edge. Um, and one of the reasons is that it's thought that uh, one of the mechanisms that these creatures use to be able to fly such long distances when they migrate is that they can use those really super broad hind wings in order to coast a little bit, in order to soar. So I think that's maybe just a little bit of an optical illusion that the wings might look a little shorter. Oh, that's great. Thanks for answering that. And then we had a quick question from Julia. Do the migratory species have substantially longer adult lifespan than other species? That's a really good question. We don't, we don't really know um, in North America. There have been some interesting studies done recently using um, different isotopes. Um, there's a way of mapping, like if you catch a dragonfly, you can look at the isotopic signature, um, the form of hydrogen that's in the water molecules in its, in its body, especially structures like the wings that don't regenerate. And you can get an idea of how far away it is from where you, you, know, where you captured it, what latitude that creature actually developed into an adult at. The data that we have so far makes it look like um, we don't have any individuals 
um, that that would go through like the migratory and then the return, except there was like one individual that the folks at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies who were doing this project a few years ago, their paper just came out on it. I can share that if you're interested, that it looked like there was one individual that may have actually made the round trip. Uh, but that was an anomaly. So um, one thing that does seem to be the case is that like with common green darner, we know that like in the exact same wetland, like the sites that you go to, you can have nymphs and adults there that are simul that, that are some of them are of what's called a residence population that will never migrate and others are migratory individuals. And it's a complex system to just kind of describe it in short for the migrants. When the generation that is returning to the north uh, is on the wing, they are mature adults. They will pause and mate. You'll see males patrolling. And so they're on the wing much earlier than any resident uh, members of the same species at those same habitats would be because the residents hibernate through the winter as nymphs. So the migrants return to the north, mating and laying eggs as they go. Those eggs hatch, their nymphs go from egg to adult within that same summer, they develop more rapidly. And when they emerge as adults, they don't hang around to mature, they don't hang around to, to, to feed and to find a mate, they take off to the south. In contrast, the non-migratory populations, they, are, you know, eggs are laid at that, that same site, the eggs hatch, the nymphs develop more slowly, and they're not ready to emerge as adults when fall comes and the weather gets cold. So they burrow into the mud and they hibernate. When spring comes and it warms up about the same time that those migratory adults are coming back, the resident nymphs are warming up, hunting, feeding. They too will emerge as adults, but they'll do it more, more like in midsummer they don't have the impulse to take off anywhere. They mature, they find mates, and they lay eggs that will hatch, develop a little bit through their, their nymphal instars, and then hibernate through the following winter. And the triggers, the ways that migratory versus resident populations are kind of keeping separate, we don't really know. Um, we haven't pinned that down yet, but it's a really fascinating system. I hope that made sense. Yeah, that was a great, thanks for explaining. It's really fascinating, it's really interesting, yeah. So common green darners, these are one of the hardest ones to catch, uh, one of the harder ones to photograph because everybody has a photo that looks like the one on the top or the one on the bottom because the only time these guys slow down is when they are copulating or when they are laying eggs. So there are photos that look like carbon copies of each other taken by different people in different habitats of the same species doing the same behavior, right? So common green darners, uh, very easy to identify, even on the wing, they're big bodied. Uh, the thorax, remember that part where the, uh, the wings and legs are, uh, is this really pretty lime green. There's no stripes, there's no dots, there's no markings on it at all. The abdomen is blue, especially in the males, kind of brownish or tan. And actually the color of the abdomen can change a little bit. Even a male with a blue abdomen on a really chilly day, uh, the color can get a little bit muted. And another thing that's very characteristic of this species is if you look down at the front of the face and you can see that there's an arrow pointing to that on the male dragon, uh, male half of the couple uh, at the top photo, they have what looks like a little round black bullseye on the top of their face, almost like what you might think of as sort of the top of the nose, although dragonflies don't have noses the way we do. No other darner has that. So it's really, really diagnostic. And again, just that contrasting lime green thorax and the blue or brown abdomen for a male or a female, it's very easy to see when they're zipping around, even if they don't land. And this is the spe one species that I said, it's a little rarer in dragonflies for the male to keep holding on to the female, but they do, uh, they do lay their eggs. The male keeps holding her. And if I didn't point this out earlier, the, the name, for the structure, I guess, that they form when the male is still holding on to the female, but they're not copulating. That's called a tandem pair because they're in tandem, you know, one after the other. Then we have the mosaic darners in the genus Eshna. And these are called mosaic because their abdomens are a kind of a dark brown background color with all these different blue spots. So it looks kind of like, you know, a mosaic of, of colored pieces on a dark background. So usually they have a dark, a dark brown um, background color, base color. 
<clears throat> blue markings on the abdomen. Uh, some of them have it on top and the underside of the abdomen, some only on the top of the abdomen. And they have pretty distinctive stripes on the sides of the thorax. Um, those are greenish to bluish, uh, sometimes maybe even with a bit of a yellowish tinge. The shape of those thoracic stripes, uh, broad or thin, outlined in black, uh, sort of with a little backward trailing flag at one end, for example, continuous versus broken, very diagnostic to species. So that's a really good part of a dragonfly to look at. It's a really good part of a dragonfly if you have a darner to try to get a photo of. I also want to pause to um, show you here for both the lower left and the upper right, the uh, variable darner and the paddle tail darner, you can see those are being held by the wings. They're being held uh, close to where the wings join the body. This is the appropriate way to hold either a dragon or a damselfly. So those are both individuals that were captured in a net and we'll have to kind of pantomime it today because there's no way dragonflies are gonna be on the wing with the kind of weather we have right now, unless it changes after lunch. Um, but when you get an individual out of the net, you wanna be able to see it, you wanna be able to photograph it and you don't wanna hurt it, right? So if you were to try to hold it by the legs, for example, it would be thrashing wildly uh, the legs would probably break off, at least some of them. It would be beating its wings really hard. It might damage the wings. Don't want to do that. You certainly don't want to hold it by that flexible, squishable abdomen, right? Don't want to do that. If you hold it by the sides of the thorax, where you can't see all those stripes and things that you need to see, for one thing, and for another, you could still squish it. And you don't want to hold it by the very ends of the wings because it will still try to beat them. And remember, I said they have really strong wing muscles. So there's a good chance it would rip the wings if that happened. So what you want to do is you want to gently grab the dragonfly and kind of stroke your fingers backwards, press those wings gently together close to where they join the body. You can still see that stigma if the color or length of that is diagnostic for the species. So that's good. You can still see wing markings and you're not going to hurt it. You're not going to hurt it. A lot of times people worry that this is going to damage or injure it. Remember, unless it is a tenoral adult with those soap bubble, soft, squishy wings, you won't hurt it holding it this way. This is the absolute appropriate way to hold it. Um, the one thing you do want to make sure of is that uh, you don't want to have like hands that are covered with sunscreen or fresh hand sanitizer or uh, insect repellent uh, when you go to grab it by the wings. That's kind of the only thing you want to avoid because then they might get kind of kind of stuck together. But when either when both of those different dragons were let go, they you know kind of stretch out their wings a little bit like, OK, that was scary. I don't know what happened. And then they take off and they're just fine. So that's how you hold a dragonfly. And I'll go over that again in the field. All right. So as I said, you're going to look at the shape and the color of the stripes on the side of the thorax and sometimes on the top of the thorax as you, as you look down on it. Uh, the shape of the cerci at the end of the male's abdomen and the location of those abdominal spots. So how does that work? So paddle tail darner. This is one where you can see those, those thoracic stripes on the side of the abdomen there are fairly broad. They're a pretty pale greenish color. They can shade to blue. Generally, the edges are straight. It might be slightly wavy. And if you were to look at the front of the face, you can see it just a little bit there at the side of the photo. There's just kind of a narrow, fine, uh, straight black line on the front of the face. This is diagnostic as well. And there are pairs of blue spots on top of every segment of the abdomen, including the last one, S10. So if you look at the lower photo, you see those almost kind of squarish looking dots in pairs. And it, you don't see the whole abdomen there, but boop, 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 all the way back. They're kind of narrow at the very, very end at the 10th abdominal segment. And then you see those broad cerci that are coming off of the tip. So the shape of the cerci is also diagnostic. So you don't always get to see every single bit of the insect. If you catch it in a net and you've got it in hand, you can look at the thorax, you can look at the face, you can look at the top of the abdomen, flip it over. Oh, there's no spots on the bottom, on the lower half of the abdomen. That's diagnostic too. You might not necessarily be able to see all of those features if you are chasing it and you're trying to get a photo because remember these things have really good eyesight and it can be hard to get close to them to get a net on them 
the males patrolling over open water. You can try to wait there and see if you can grab them or see if you can get a good in focus photo, but it'll be, it can be kind of tough. So you may not be able to check off every one of these features, but you just try to get enough of them to narrow in on, you know, I think it's, it's probably this, or maybe it's this or that, and just sort of try to narrow in on what you think the genus and the species are. And then the Circe are, are flattened. They look like, they look like the blades of a paddle. And there's this little trailing spike, this little trailing spine that comes off the very tip. And you can kind of see that um, in the lower right hand part of the upper photo, just a little spike that comes off. So paddle tail darn name for the, the shape of those Circe, very, very diagnostic. Variable darner is named because the stripes on the sides of its thorax can vary in whether they are continuous or whether they're kind of dotted or broken up. Um, and the ones that I have seen more often have had that very broken interrupted striping. But even if they are fully present from one end to the other, they're very narrow. They tend to be kind of a pretty sky blue. Um, and like the paddle tail darner, there's blue spots on top of the abdomen, including S10 and none below the abdomen. So some of these have similar traits. They're not all, everything is different. They have a black line on the face, but they're Circe. If you look at that photo, just kind of look like little ski slope things coming off the back. They're not those broad, flattened paddle-like structures with that trailing spike. So very different Circe, simple, not paddle-typed Circe. The shadow darner, this one tends to show up a little bit later in the summer uh, in the sites that we have. Their thoracic stripes are green uh, instead of blue. And there's a little, I don't have a good photo that shows this, but there, there's a little jaggedy rearward extension at the top. So they're not just that straight uh, kind of swoop. And they have little pairs of blue spots on the top of the abdomen, but not on the 10th abdominal segment. And they also have spots on the underside of the abdomen. So that's really different from the previous two. No black line across the front of the face. Also different from the previous two, but like the paddle tail darner, they have those broad paddle shaped circe with a little trailing spike at the lower end. And then looking a little bit similar, but with some structural differences, we have what are called the neotropical darners. It's a different genus, Ryaneshna. These tend to be much more blue. You don't see the greens and yellows uh, as much that you see with uh, the mosaic darners. And the other thing is, you can kind of see this. They have a little nubbin, a little tubercule on the underside of their first abdominal segment. And so if you look at that upper picture, you can see on the second abdominal segment, there's the little nubbin that tells you that it's a male. You see those secondary genitalia. And if you look at sort of like where you might think of as the elbow of that, the, the biggest pair of legs, right above it, there's this little tiny cone-shaped nubbin. That's the tubercule that tells you you're looking at a neotropical darner. And again, you're gonna look at the stripes on the side of the thorax and the shape of the circe at the tip of the male's abdomen to get a good identification on these. So one of the ones that you're gonna become really familiar with is the blue-eyed darner, Ryaneshna multicolor. It is a gorgeous creature. Um, the entire face, the eyes, the whole front of the face is this lovely sky blue. And it's such a pale, bright blue. Even if it never lands, you can see it in flight. As long as it turns towards you a little bit so that you can see the whole face, it just glows this lovely, this lovely powder blue color. There's no black line across the front of the face. The thoracic stripes, the stripes on the side of the thorax are that same pale blue. Uh, they're very straight, uh, no rearward flagging or anything like that. They're continuous, they're not broken. Also has blue spots in pairs on the top of the abdomen, including the, the last abdominal segment, not on the underside of the abdomen. And the Circe on the male, you can see that close up in the narrower photo there. It looks like a crescent wrench. They're forked at the tips. So super, super, super diagnostic here. California darners. These tend to be the first darners that we see in the springtime. They come out a little bit early. They're a little smaller than the other darners. They're still a big dragonfly, but once you start to see some of these other darners, like the shadow and the paddle-tailed and the blue-eyed, in flight, you know, you'll be like, oh, it's springtime or it's early summer. And that 
it just looks like a, it's a little bit smaller than some of the other darners I've seen. So that's the, the California darner, Ryanishna californica. It also does have blue eyes, but they are only blue in the upper for portion. The lower half of them uh, is just a kind of a dark brown. The face is also darker. It does not have that sky blue face that the uh, that the blue eye darner has. It does have a black line on the face. Blue eye darner does not. Um, and the thoracic stripes are also pale blue, but they're narrower than the blue eye darner, and they have kind of a black edging on the front stripe, gets a little narrower at the top. Again, blue spots on top of the abdomen, including S10, not on the underside of the abdomen. And they don't have those cerci. The males don't have those cool uh, wrench shaped or forked cerci that the blue eye does. So I know that this is a lot to throw at you, um, but remember, you've got field guides, you've got resources. And one of the big things that I really want you to come away with here is not to be able to repeat back to me, this is what everything looks like on a blue eyed darner. This is what everything looks like on a paddle darner. I want you to know what to look at. I want you to know, oh, I need to look at those thoracic stripes. I need to see if I can get a good shot of the, the back part of the body so I can see the eye color, so I can see if there's spots on all those abdominal segments. Those are the tools you need, not just memorizing what all these different traits are. Like I said, I hope that distinction is, uh, uh, is clear in your minds. Any questions about the darners before we go on to the skimmers? Um, looks like there's one, there's two questions here. One is from Katie. Katie asks, what is the bullseye structure on the green darner? Is it just coloring or is it some sort of sensory structure? Oh, that's a good question. As far as you tell us, it's just coloring. Um, it's just, you know, there's so many complicated color patterns on these creatures and nobody really knows why. You know, it's like a bird having crazy plumage, but it doesn't seem to be used in mating or anything. So no, it's just this little dark spot on the top of the head. Doesn't okay. seem to be And then Katie also asked, is only the male blue-eyed in the is only the male blue-eyed in the blue-eyed and California darners? So I guess the question is, is the male the one that looks uh, Oh, I see. Um, is there a difference? It is the, the, so for the darner species, the females tend to be greener, um, more green than blue, and that's kind of true across the boards. Um, and a lot of times the coloration is a little bit more dull. Female darners can actually be a little bit, a little bit tough um, to identify some of the mosaic darners, but definitely the brighter blue colors are in the, the males. But, you know, the thing is about, and of course the females don't have Cersei, right? Cause they're, you know, they're not males, but the spot patterns, uh, the shape of the, the thoracic stripes, the presence or absence of a black line on the face, that will all be consistent whether you're looking at a male or a female of, of, of the species, that particular you know, character, combination of characteristics. Okay, thank you. And then Will just had a question. I think this will be our last one for this break. Are any of these individual species indicator species or are the dragonfly slash damselflies good indicators as a whole? Ah, that's a good question. So. Um, dragonflies in some cases are considered to be umbrella species because they are such predators. If you've got a healthy established dragonfly or damselfly population, it means that there's a stable prey base. So it can give you a little bit of an idea about habitat quality, habitat uh, consistency, right? Um, some of them need perennial water, others are fine with wetlands that dry down. So the community of dragon and damselflies at a site can give you an idea of uh, the water pattern throughout the year. Some of them are more characteristic of running water. Some are more characteristic of still water. So again, you can get habitat um, ideas uh, out of this. And so they tend to, many of them, tend to be a little bit more tolerant. And I'm putting air quotes around that because if you are a species that is adapted to living in a wetland or into slower water, of course you can survive where the water is a little warmer. That's what happens when water is slow, right? And not flowing. Of course you can survive. The water is a little, a little less oxygenated because warm water doesn't have as much dissolved oxygen in it. So if you're accustomed to thinking of indicator species like mayflies, caddisflies, stoneflies, those are good bugs. We want those in aquatic systems. You know, dragon and damselflies be like, oh, well, you know, they're kind of tolerant. They're kind of tolerant. But there are metrics that have been developed specifically for slower systems where mayflies and caddisflies and stoneflies aren't going to hide out that do use things like the diversity and or the abundance of dragon and damselfly species um, as an indicator of habitat quality. So they have been incorporated into um, some, some different biomonitoring metrics. Yep, absolutely. And we have seen, uh, if you've checked out any of the, the annual reports, 
reports that are on the, the, the Watership Council website, um, we've seen changes, shifts in the community composition of um, dragon and damselflies that you know, folks like you have monitored at some different sites, like the one we're gonna meet at this afternoon as the habitat has changed. And so they can definitely reflect changes in physical habitat conditions. Excellent question. Thanks, Celeste, that's all the questions. Okay, so the next family is, uh, it's funny. Sometimes people are like, you know, everybody wants to see club tails. Um, you know, it's like they're the finches or something of the, of the insect world. And, you know, they're exciting, they're cool, they're neat darners, oh, those are big, those are, those are really cool. Some of them have more like specialized habitat considerations. And sometimes people are kind of like, eh, skimmers, they're really common, you know? And I mean, they are, this is the majority probably of what you're gonna see when you're out monitoring. Not that you won't see darners, because you will. Um, but a lot of these are slower water, still water species. They can be really abundant where they occur. Um, and so they're not rare. They're not like, ooh, this is a special sighting necessarily, but they're really, really pretty. And I know I myself sometimes have to kind of, you know, catch myself a little bit and be like, oh my God, it's another common white tail. I'm like, yeah, but you know, common white tails are really kind of pretty. And even for species like this that are really common, you know, people say, well, every, every species that is now rare was probably once a lot more common. So even, you know, even though you might find yourself getting kind of sick of tule bluets or kind of sick of common white tails, do they remain common? Do they remain abundant? Do they, do they ebb or flow? You know, it's still important to monitor the reason. They're still really pretty. So there are a lot of different genera uh, and types of dragonflies that fall under this heading of the skimmers. They're kind of kind of stubbier, a little chunkier than the than the darners that you saw. Definitely a little bit smaller overall. Although still, you know, good sized insect. Sturdy, colorful. They've got lots of different complicated patterns. Not just actual physical coloration like the 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 dark wings on that common white tail at the bottom, or the little amber flush on the the blue dasher in the middle, but that pruinosity, that fine powdery waxy sort of coating, and they're really gorgeous. Similar to the darners, those big eyes that are squished together on top of the head, they touch along the seam. And as I said, they're widespread and common. But one good thing about that is it can make them really, really easy to identify, uh, even just from a, from a photo. So we'll start with the genus Labellula, uh, which is the king skimmers is the common name. This is a group that has a lot of that pruinosity as well as a lot of color patterning on their wings. And so developing that pruinosity is one way that you know that you're looking at a mature older adult. And this is both males and older females develop this pruinosity. Sometimes in some species, it's only the males that do that. In these king skimmers, the females get it as well. So if you look at the top right there, that is an eight spotted skimmer, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight spots, two on each wing. And you know that it's not a tenoral, right? Those wings aren't so bubbly. It's got, you know, coloration, but it is not an older female because the older females are going to get some of that pruinosity. And so if you look on the left, there's a male there and it's got bright, almost reflective white pruinose patches in between the black spots on the wing. And the abdomen and the upper part of the thorax also gets covered with that pruinosity. So you know you've got mature individuals. And you can also see a little spot sort of in the middle of the abdomen on the sides where the brown is showing through a little bit more. You also know that that male has made it at least one time. Because remember when the female swings her abdomen up to engage with his genitalia, she holds on to him. And her claws, her little tarsal claws, as they kind of scritch and hold on, scrape off some of that pruinosity. She also told that that male has made it at least once. So the, the 12 spotted skimmer has a total of 12 black spots, three on each one of its wings. Again, it develops pruinosity uh, on the wings and on the abdomen. And it also has, it has this brown abdomen with yellow markings along the sides. And the yellow forms more of a continuous stripe along the sides of the abdomen. That is true for both the males and the females. That will become an important point for identification. Uh, so keep it in your head, because um, I'm going to point it out again a little bit later. Four spotted skimmers. These were not species that we had anticipated necessarily to see at our site. They're not super common around here. I tend to associate them with higher elevation, but we have occasionally seen these four spotted skimmers uh, at a couple of our different sites. And by a funny coincidence, the very first time that a four spotted skimmer was seen at one of the project sites here in Portland, unexpected, kind of an unexpected finding, 
up in Seattle, Dennis Paulson, the fellow who wrote Dragonflies and Damselflies of the West, also unexpectedly saw four spotted skimmers at a place that he visits regularly in the city of Seattle to monitor. So that's kind of an interesting coincidence. Four spotted skimmers uh, don't develop that pruinosity. They're kind of dull, uh, a browny yellow color. The uh, end of the abdomen is black. It does still have those yellow stripes along the side. And their spots aren't those big showy spots. It's the little tiny spots that you see on the leading edge of the wing. And, and they're very chubby. It almost looks like somebody took a bicycle pump and sort of pumped up their abdomen a little bit. So super distinctive when you see those perched uh, or even on the wing. And then really show we've got the flame skimmer, Labellula saturata. This is a species whose range did not used to extend this far north. It is thought that probably as a result of climate change, it has been able to penetrate further north. And at one point, Westmoreland Park, where you are gonna be this afternoon, was the northernmost spot in the west that this species had ever been seen. And then of course, Jim Johnson up in, uh, up in Washington, knew it was down here. He also found it at Tanner Springs Park in downtown and he was on the lookout for it in Washington. The following year, he found it in Washington, published an article about it in that journal of the DSA, Argia. So we have been able to map species range expansions as a part of this project. And the flame skimmer is a lovely kind of orangey colored um, dragonfly. It doesn't have any of that pruinosity or anything, but there's a really pretty kind of ambery orange wash or flush uh, on the wings, especially um, closer to, uh, to where they join the body. This has become a fairly common dragonfly to see at a lot of our different sites. The widow skimmer uh, does have black wings with white pruinosity, but a very different patterning. So you can see for the male that those black patches on both the front and the rear pair of wings go from where the wings join the body out to uh, about halfway out, you know, almost to where that notices. And then there's those broad flashes of white pruinosity and the abdomen gets pruinose as well. So this is called the widow skimmer because it almost looks like it's it's in a black cloak, right? It's in a black shroud like you would be if you were, if you were in mourning, right? Because you were a, a widow. Um, and the female has a broader abdomen. Um, she has still that dark patterning on the, um, on the wings and uh, a broader yellow stripe on the side of the abdomen. Common white tail. This is, this is well named, it is extremely common. Uh, and it's a little bit of a pain in the butt because it's very territorial. So just when you've gotten yourself positioned to take a photo of that, that Western pond hawk that you've been tracking and it finally perched, a stupid common white tail is gonna come along and fly at it and zoom it off of its perch. It's really a pain in the butt. But it's a pretty species, it's a fairly common species. Um, I've actually had a male hanging out in my yard uh, and I'm like a mile away from the nearest large source of water for the last week. Not sure what it's doing, but it's definitely maturing and getting ready to go back to the water. So if you look at the upper right photo, that is a male. That's a pretty distinctive looking dragonfly. You might think at first that it looks a little like a widow skimmer, except those broad back black patches are in like the middle third of the wing, not in the basal portion of the wing. And it doesn't get that bright white stuff on the wings, just along the, the abdomen. But if you take a look at the female of a common white tail, there's a female perched on the rock, that's the photo on the left hand side. You go, wait a minute. I see a dragonfly with three black spots on each of its wings. Doesn't that look like a tall spotted skimmer? This is one of the classic mistakes that someone new to dragonfly identification makes. They see a female common whitetail and they think, oh, that's, that's a 12 spotted skimmer. The difference here is, and there is a female 12 spotted skimmer on the lower right for comparison. The 12 spotted skimmer has a continuous yellow line going down each side of the abdomen. Look at the common white tail female. There is still yellow on the sides of the abdomen, but it's like an angled dash on each segment. It is not a smooth line. So one of the ways I remember this is that the genus name for common white tail is Plathemus. And those little dashes on the side look like plates stacked up in a rack. And so that's just like a little mental mnemonic that I use to remember the difference between them. So if you see, if you see those 12 black spots on the wings, don't automatically assume that you've got a 12 spotted skimmer. Try to get a look at the side of the abdomen and see if you see a continuous line, 12 spotted skimmer, 
little dashed broken lines, common white tip. Meadowhawks. Meadowhawks are uh, easy to photograph because they like to perch. And even if they fly out from the perch, they tend to have perch fidelity. They'll come back and they'll, they'll perch in the same place again. Um, they tend to be pretty reddish overall. There's some uh, black mixed in as well, but they're, they're smaller than either the darners or the skinner, skimmers. Um, kind of narrow abdomens, reddish coloration, orangey coloration. And the chart that you see here, that is from that dragonflies and damselflies of Oregon. It's a really super useful identification key. And you might be able to see all the text there, but for each species, it tells you the coloration on the head, what type of stripes or lack of stripes or dots there are on the thorax on the sides. Are the wings clear? Do they have a colored wash? Are there, are there, is there coloration in the veins at the front end? What's the color pattern on the abdomen? and what color are the legs. And all of those can be useful and important in identification. So this is a really, a really useful thing to be able to use. So they're, they're very pretty. Uh, as I said, they tend to perch pretty patiently. So it's not hard to get good photos of them and even to kind of move around to be able to be like, I really want to get a side photo to see what the side of the abdomen or the side of the thorax looks like. Um, we've got usually cardinal meadowhawks, which are this beautiful bright scarlet color variegated meadowhawks that have the sort of glowing silvery rectangles down the sides of the abdomen. So those are two fairly common species that you'll probably see at our different sites. Um, although we do have a handful of different types of meadowhawks that might show up at, at our different sites, we're in the range. So var variegated meadowhawk is another one of those migratory dragonflies, even though it's a little smaller than some of the other migratory darners. The males to me always look like they're wearing like a Scottish plaid kilt. Uh, the base color of the abdomen is red, but they have these uh, kind of lighter colored rectangular patches that go down the sides of the abdomen. The sides of the thorax have a gray stripe that ends in a bright yellow dot. That gets a little dull when they get older, but it's, it's pretty visible. You can see that in the one that I have in hand in the lower left. And the females are not really as red. They're a lot more yellow. The stripes on the side of the thorax are a lot more visible and they have these beautiful reflective white rectangles that go down the sides of the abdomen. And I'll see those in my yard as well. That female was uh, perched in, a, uh, in my garden for like an entire day. Blue dashers, very common in, in slower water systems as are Western pond hawks. Uh, Left-hand side, you see blue dasher, female and male. Right-hand side, you see Western pond hawk, uh, female and male. And if you look at the female of each one, the blue dasher uh, is named based on those yellow markings. So it's got these little dashy yellow stripes, thin narrow yellow stripes going down the abdomen, on the thorax. It looks pretty different from that female Western pond hawk. She's bigger. She's a beautiful uh, lime green color. It's like, that's not hard to tell those two apart. The problem comes with the males because both the male blue dasher and the male western pond hawk, as they mature, get covered with that pruinosity. And so all that brown background color of the dasher gets colored up. All that lime green uh, background color of the pond hawk gets colored up. Uh, a young male western pond hawk looks a lot like the female that you see up there. Both of them like to perch. Both of them can be found in exactly the same habitats. But there is a dead giveaway, and you can see it if you look at each one of the respective male photos. Male blue dashers have uh, kind of Kelly green, emerald green eyes, and a bright, shiny white face. And you can see that in that profile picture there. Male western pond hawks have more of a dark teal colored eyes, not the bright green, more of a sort of a bluer kind of shade. And the front of their face is sort of a dirty green. It is not that bright, shiny, reflective white. This is the second most common mistake that people new to dragonfly identification make, confusing a mature male blue dasher with a mature male western pond hawk and vice versa. Just look at the head, color of the eyes, color of the face, totally easy to tell them apart. And the females that don't get that pruinosity are very, very different looking from each other and very easy to tell apart. Our remaining three migratory species, black saddlebags and the wandering and spot winged gliders. You can really see those broad hind wings, uh, characteristic of migrants on that spot wing glider on the, on the lower left. Um, of those three, 
We have seen spot-winged glider one time at one of our monitoring sites. Black saddlebags is a pretty frequent appearance and we have not yet seen the wandering glider. So both spot-winged and wandering gliders are really more tropical species and they rely on uh, like rainwater pools in order to breed. So it's thought that they have no choice but to be migratory. They have to follow the rain, they move north, they lay their eggs, and then they retreat back into the south. So they don't, there are no resident populations of those as far north as we are. They don't overwinter here. They have to kind of move back up and then they retreat back down every season. So the black saddlebags, uh, very, very dark body, dark face, dark head. There is a pair of yellow spots about two thirds of the way down the abdomen. They get very dull in older males and they can be hard to see, but they're named because they have these sort of weird, complicated looking dark, dark blotches close to where the pair of hind wings joins the body. And there's a little like see-through window in the middle of that black blotch on each wing and only on the hind wings. So very different from say the widow skimmer, the eight or 12 spotted skimmer, the common white tails, um, very distinctive type of pattern. And these guys do not like to perch. They just fly, 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 fly. It's hard to get photos of them. Um, spot wing glider, uh, it's a little hard to see, but there's sort of a dark brownish uh, blotch, um, again, close to where the wings, the hind pair of wings joins the body. Wandering glider looks similar. These have mostly kind of a tan uh, coloration, very broad hind wings, uh, not a lot of markings on the, on the thorax. A little bit more unexpected visitors, even though they are on the species list for Multnomah County. Um, and the spot wing glider that was found at one of our sites was a very opportunistic record. It was somebody who had been to their site several times and they simply knew they had not seen something that looked like this dragonfly before. They did not know what it was. They knew it wasn't a darner. It didn't look like any of the skimmers they had seen. And they got a couple of what were not actually super duper photos but they were good enough that it was able to be identified as a spot wing glider. This was a really unexpected find um, for us and we have not seen it again. Why did it show up that particular year? The emeralds, um, these are generally a family that is associated with a little bit higher elevation sites than we are here in the valley, although you, you can see them uh, you don't have to travel too far from home. Um, these are on this, uh, the species list for, for our county. We have not found them in the site yet. Emeralds are so named because they tend to have a very reflective emerald green metallic coloration or reflective coloration. Um, so spiny basket tail, uh, they're, they're very fuzzy. Uh, emeralds in general as adults, they have this very hairy fuzzy thorax and you can really see that fine fuzz uh, on both of the photos here of the spiny basket tail. They're kind of dull colored actually for emeralds, sort of a dull tannish color. Um, they've got Circe that have this little dog tooth, this little spine on the underneath. Um, we have not seen those in our area. I don't really expect them to be here um, in Multnomah County, but it is one of the ones that you'll see on the species list. It's been found here at least sometime in the past. Uh, cruisers, the Macromedi. Again, we are not on large fast rivers, but it is not impossible. Um, I see these Western River cruisers on the Columbia, on the Willamette River, they may fly up. Um, this is a really distinctive, large, uh, yellow and brown stripy dragonfly. And one of the things about it is that uh, his eyes are a little bit further separated. It's got these pearly gray eyes. Um, the abdomen sort of flares a little bit towards the end, especially in the males. Uh, it's arched a little bit when it perches or flies. Again, not most likely to see, but one that is in the county, you might see it at other sites. And then club tails. So this particular family is called club tails because in the male, the last few segments of the abdomen are very broad and very flared, that's what they call club tails. Um, the one that you're most likely to see that's most common in this area is called the olive club tail. And one of the characteristics of the club tail family is that unlike most other dragonflies, their eyes are kind of small, well, I mean, not tiny, but smaller than like a darner's eyes. And there's a little bit of separation in between them. That's very, very distinctive. So the separated eyes and that clubby abdomen really, really distinctive. Um, I would have said last year that this was not one that we would expect to see at any of our sites, but when I was monitoring at Westmoreland Park uh, last, mm, probably early summer, I caught just a fleeting glimpse of something perched on a shrub 
And it was enough of a glimpse to know that it was a club tail. It was most likely an olive club tail that had probably flown up maybe from Crystal Springs or Johnson Creek, but I didn't have enough of a glimpse of it to feel you know, confident adding it to the, to the data sheets, to the, to the project data as, yeah, I definitely saw an olive club tail. Uh, but that was the first time we'd seen a club tail at any of the sites. So keep your eye out for somebody with those uh, blue eyes and that clubby, clubby abdomen, because uh, it would be very cool if we, if we actually did see this again. There's also the sinuous snake tail, uh, another type of club tail. These are also like any club tail has separated eyes, but they're more gray than blue. Uh, it's got more kind of a pale olivey green kind of coloration. The shoulder stripes are kind of wavy. That's why it's called the sinuous snake tail. Again, it has a flared abdomen like, uh, um, like most others. And I actually saw this in abundance for the first time this year. I was hiking um, at Cottonwood Canyon State Park um, in, in May, I think it was, and they were emerging all over the place. So both of those are younger, uh, definitely a tenoral down there on the bottom right, and they were just flying up from the river down there. It was really neat. So that is a very quick run through the dragonflies, all right? They are diverse, they are varied, and like I said, concentrate on what bits of it do I need to look at to be able to figure out, you know, even if you're ruling out something, well, I know it definitely can't be this because there's blue spots on top of every single abdominal segment. Oh, well, I know it's a darner and I know it can't be this kind of darner because they don't have spots on the top of S10. Just trying to kind of narrow it down, you know, thoracic stripes, color of the eyes, color of the face, patterning on the abdomen. And you're just going to become more and more familiar with these. You'll get familiar with what you see earlier in the summer, later in the summer, just like birds, these species do have a seasonality to, to adult activity. First darners, first of those, you know, mosaic type darners that you see on the wing in the spring, very good chance, even if you don't get a super good look at it, it's probably gonna be a California darner. Later in the summer, you're gonna see a lot of shadow darners. You're gonna see a lot of blue eyed darners. So you're also gonna, you know, kind of get used to that. So it's just, it's just a process. It's just a process of familiarizing and keying in, learning to have your, your brain and your eyes key in on some of these different uh, distinctive types of, uh, types of structures and patterns. And uh, luckily, you know, although there are, what is it, 44 species now on the list for Multnomah County, at any one time, I think the greatest number of species that anybody has seen in one survey visit to any of the sites is 13. So it's not like you're gonna be overwhelmed with all 44 species of dragon and damselflies that we have in the county. You're gonna get familiar with what you tend to see on a regular basis. And then your mind is gonna be prepared to latch onto, you look different. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to grab you. I'm gonna to try to get a photo of you. I hope that's reassuring. Any new questions before we uh, go on to the damselflies? Uh, no new questions right now, but I just want to give you a heads up, Celeste. I was thinking at maybe 1145, we could transition to some of the survey protocol stuff that I would cover. Yeah, yeah. and I'll be, I, I might be a little bit beyond that, um, but I'll be getting into like the iNatural, how to use iNaturalist in just a few minutes. Okay, cool. That sounds great. Thanks. Great. So three main categories or families of damselflies, the broad winged represented there by that beautiful river jewel wing at the upper right, the spread wings, see that on the lower left, the California spread wing and the pond damsels, which includes a few different genera, the dancers and the bluets, for example. These are gonna be some of the most abundant ones that you're gonna see at your site. You're gonna get really familiar with what these guys look like. So spread wings, are the exception to when I told you that when damselflies perch, they hold their wings pressed together above their bodies. Spread wings are called spread wings because they kind of perch with their wings a little bit splayed, a little bit cattywampus, very diagnostic um, of the fact that you're looking at a spread wing. And for damselflies, they're kind of big. Um, once you've taken a look at some bluets, some fork tails, you're going to be startled, especially by the size of something like the California spread wing. The body length, although it is more slender, it's about as long as some of our smaller dragonflies like meadowhawks. It's a startlingly large damselfly. And for some of the other types of males uh, in a different genus, Lestes, the males are a lovely metallic emerald green and they do develop some of that pruinosity as they mature. But California spread wings, this is the most common one that we will see of the spread wing family at our different sites. 
uh, the males have bright blue eyes and the bodies of males and females both are kind of tan and brown. Um, but the blue eyes and the size of this thing is really gonna be what catches your eye. They're very, very noticeable and very easy to identify. The lesties, the emerald spread wing types are a little bit more difficult to identify. I'm actually gonna flash through these a little bit quickly because sort of contrary to my expectations, the only spread wings we have ever found at any of our sites for the project are actually California spread wings. What I will say is that uh, the Lestes genus of spread wings, these are the ones that have uh, oftentimes metallic green on their abdomen or their thorax. They oftentimes will also develop pruinosity and the pattern of pruinosity can help you with identifying them. And you also really need to look at the male terminal structures, the cerci uh, and the uh, parapox that come off of the end of that, that 10th abdominal segment, because as weird as it sounds, the way those are, are they curved? Are they hooked? Do they cross each other? Do they flare out? Um, that is one of the most distinctive ways to identify these. So in other places in Multnomah County, I have found uh, spread wings in this genus, uh, only one, the liar tip spread wing. Um, so I'm going to flash through these pretty quickly because they're not the most likely ones that you're going to encounter. So we've got emerald spread wings that are in the county, spotted spread wing that has little dark spots on the underside of the thorax. You can see that the paraprox here are sort of short, looks very different from the paraprox of the emerald spread wing. Lyre tipped, so called, because the paraprox look like a Greek lyre. You can see that in the photograph here as well as in the drawing. And then the last ones that you're really going to see a lot of are in the pond damsel group, the family of Synagrionidae. So the dancers, which are in the genus Argia. Uh, they're called dancers because they have a kind of bouncy flight. They also have what look like really hairy legs. And you know, all dragon and damselflies have spiny legs, but the spines on the legs of dancers, they're longer than the distance between each individual spine is. So even in a photo or, or if you're looking with binoculars, they're gonna look kind of spiky and hairy. And when they perch, they do perch with their wings held together, but they're held sort of above the level of the abdomen. And you can see that here in both the male and female vivid dancers. And vivid dancers are the only members of this genus that we've seen at any sites. And in addition to the coloration of the male, which is this lovely indigo color, those little black arrowheads on the side of each abdominal segment, rearward facing arrowheads are very, very distinctive, even in ones that are still pretty immature, actually, um, you can see that. Then we got a few different potential types of the bluets uh, or analagma as the genus is. They don't have that bouncy flight. Their leg spines are a little bit less obvious or pronounced because they're shorter. And when they perch, they do hold their wings sort of along the same uh, plane as their abdomen. So the most abundant one that you're gonna see are the Thule bluets, analagma corunculatum. There's a copulating pair on the upper right there. And occasionally we have seen what are called nobos, and nobo is shorthand for, it's either a northern bluet or a boreal bluet. They look really, really similar and you've got to get a very close look at the male genitalia to be able to be sure. Now, the difference between at first glance, a tule and a northern bluet or a boreal bluet is that the boreals, uh, the nobos have more blue than black on their abdominal segments. The tules have more black than blue on most of their abdominal segments. Um, and that's actually something that shows up pretty obviously, even if you're looking at them when they are perched. Um, oh, and that's basically what I just said here. And then the other thing about the tule bluets, uh, which gives them their, 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 their Latin name, is that there's a little, little white nubbin, a little white tubercle at the very end of the, uh, the male abdomen, the male cerci. And sometimes that shows up in photos and sometimes it doesn't. You can kind of see it there. It looks like there's little pale dots at the tip of the tule bluets abdomens. And as I said before, the nobos have more blue than black on their abdomens. And in a weird way to my eyes, at least, it sort of makes them look um, a little bigger. Uh, although they're not, it's just the color, the color contrast. Uh, alkali bluet is on the species list for Multnomah County. I, we've never seen it in any of our sites. Um, it does show up in fresh water, but this is not its ideal habitat. So I'm gonna flash past that and finish up with the fork tails. You will become so familiar with Pacific fork tails. They are the first damselfly on the wing in the spring. They are the last damselfly on the wing in the late summer and fall. 
the males, uh, really the males and females can't be confused with too much else. Uh, you can see that they have mostly a dark black abdomen with uh, uh, S9, S8 and S9 are colored uh, a pale blue. They're very small and very slender, but that dark abdomen with the blue tip, it's almost like these little threads with blue tail lights that are flying around. So that's real noticeable. And then the male, the top of the thorax, you can see one, two, three, four little blue dots, really super distinctive. The female has a more solidly colored thorax, but she also does have that blue, um, that blue tip. And of course, these are called fork tails because the males, uh, the tip of the abdomen has a little short nubby forked projection. And then um, so that specific fork tail, I basically just went through that uh, through that description. The females can look very pinky when they are young and they get a little duller kind of pinkish blue as they, uh, as they age, but still with that little blue tail light as you can see there. And you can see that that female, uh, that damsel is being held by the wings close to the body the same way that you would hold a dragonfly. Western fork tails are little, they're tiny, they have funny stubby stumpy little bodies and you are far more likely to see a female than a male. Um, they're very pretty. The males have a, a very green uh, eye spots and thorax. Again, a dark abdomen with blue at the, at, the, at the tip. And young females are the very pretty pale peachy orange color uh, when they are young. And unlike most other dragon and damsels where it's the male that gets prunose, it's the female here that gets prunose. So you'll see this dusky blue little stumpy body. You can see her abdomen's not very much longer than her wings. And they really like to lay their eggs in patches of floating moss and floating vegetation. Um, and so those are really common and abundant at a lot of our sites. The males are a little bit rarer sightings. Red damselflies uh, are a little bit uh, different. Obviously, they're bright red. They've got black tip at the, of the abdomen. Again, they're on the species list. I do not expect us to find them at our site, so I'm going to pass through those. River jewel wings, I would have said, I would not have expected to see at our sites. They like a little bit faster moving water, but uh, there was a somewhat opportunistic, slightly blurry photo that was taken a couple of years ago now uh, at Westmoreland Park that was nevertheless most distinctively and definitively a river jewel wing. Um, these are beautiful, beautiful insects. Again, they're kind of big for damselflies. Um, and these are, these are the broad wing damsels. So where the wing joins the body, it's not a narrow stalk or stem the way it is with like the pond damsels and the spread wings. It's much broader and the wings themselves are much broader. Um, and the body is this gorgeous metallic green. These are, these are just pretty, pretty damselflies and very, very distinctive looking. So let's talk about the monitoring protocol. I said that this has all the details for every single step of what you will need to do when you're out doing your surveys. Please do familiarize yourself with it. The timing that we hope for is to do monitoring during as regularly as we can throughout the flight season. Our goal is about once every two weeks. Now that, that date slides around a little bit because maybe the weather's not good, it's too hot, it's too windy. Maybe one of the people on the survey team has something come up and can't make it. So we, our goal is once every 14 days. We tend to stick to that pretty well, but it's okay if that slides a little bit. And you will be planning and signing up, and Tiffany will talk more about this uh, via Google Doc system um, for the surveys that you're going to do. And you're not going out alone. You're not going out alone. Um, I don't like people doing field work, uh, you know, by themselves. I mean, these are urban sites, you know, not dangerous or anything. But there's nutria holes, you know, there's slippery banks. It's just never a good idea to go out by yourself. So you'll be going out with a team. So you won't you won't be launched on your own. The other thing is I said, boy, we're really not going to see dragonflies today. Dragonflies are sun lovers, right? So when you're looking at your schedule and your precious free time and when can you go out and do this, look at the weather forecast. Because if it is too chilly, remember these are insects, they're cold blooded, dragonflies and damselflies will not be on the wing. And this table is in the monitoring protocol, by the way, so you don't need to worry about memorizing it. If it is too hot, they will be perched in the shade. They can overheat and dry out. If it's really cloudy, they might not be flying. If it's windy, they might not be flying. So this table kind of shows you the combination of temperature, cloud cover, wind, and if it's raining, forget about it. They're not gonna be out when it's raining. Um, and you can use this, look at the weather forecast and figure out what's the best day to likely be able to go out. And even if it's a day where a high is gonna be like 92, you can say, oh, I'm gonna go out a little earlier. I'm gonna do my survey at 10.30 instead of at 2.30 in the afternoon. 
it'll still be a little cooler. The insects, you know, will be out and about. So this is, this is a way to kind of plan whether or not you're going to go do your survey. You know, just be careful. Don't, don't work alone. Take, look before you step. There's down bogs, there's blackberry, there's teasel. Um, sometimes there's dead nutria or dead ducks. Uh, you don't want to wander into a wasp nest. Uh, you know, wear hats, stay hydrated. You're, you're going to be out in the sun, right? So just take the normal precautions you would take if you were out, you know, for a day hiking, right? I, I prefer wearing long pants, even if it's a hot day, protects you against those blackberries, uh, you know, protects you against getting scraped or, or anything like that. And what you're basically going to be doing is a slow, deliberate walk. So uh, there are three different sites that we monitor. And you're going to be walking usually along the edge of the water. Uh, keep your eyes out, though, as you're on a trail, as you're on a path. It's all fair game. And pause at intervals. You know, these might be perched. They might be flying. They might be patrolling out over the open water. They might be hunting up in the vegetation. You may see a mating pair that's perched or flying around. You may be lucky enough to see that adult emergence process. You may see the adults that are laying their eggs. Um, so all of these are, are fair game. And some of you will be going around wetlands and some of you will be going around wetlands and a creek. Uh, kind of all depends on your site. Pause and do a visual scan at intervals. Try to do sort of, you know, start at one end of the site and go to the other. You want to avoid double counting. So if you count a couple of dragonflies on the way as you're walking in, like to your site, you don't want to count them again on the way out. So, you know, kind of think to yourself, have I, have I seen that one before? Is that one that was just flying around and there's really two, not four um, of that species? So we don't want to kind of artificially inflate our counts. You'll see the data sheet in a minute. You're going to record abundance, the number of the different species, a uh, number of individuals in the different species you see. And you're going to take note of these behaviors. Do you see a wheel of a mating pair, a tandem pair, egg laying, do you see males or females or both? Do you see tandem pairs? Uh, do you see newly emerged tenoral adults? Any or all of those that you know will be recorded on the data sheet. And we are using the iNaturalist website as the portal and the data repository for this project. So I'll get to that, how to use that in just a second, but um, this is the data sheet. So at the top, uh, the little yellow rectangle at the top. Uh, basic information. So the date, the name of the site, please use the official name of the site. Don't make anything up, makes my job a lot harder. What time you started your survey, what time you ended it. That is also very important because one of the things that Johnson Creek is able to record is match time uh, when they're applying for grants and things from volunteers. So person hours is actually really important for them to know. So the time you started, the time you ended. The names of the observers, and that can even just be your first names, as long as we don't have a lot of overlap of first names among surveyors. Uh, what the temperature was, note if you recorded that in Celsius or Fahrenheit, was the wind calm, light, moderate, or strong, and a rough estimate of the cloud cover. Totally sunny, totally overcast, in which case you shouldn't be surveying, 10%, 25% cloud cover, like that. Um, so basic information, weather conditions, any irrelevant notes, like the water level is really high, or there's a new beaver dam, or uh, maybe other wildlife or something that you saw. And then as you do your survey, there's a space for you to record the name of each species that you saw. So Pacific Forktail, Thule Bluet, Variegated Meadowhawk, common name is fine, abbreviations are fine, as long as you know what you're talking about. And then for each species, circle if you saw only males, only females, circle both if you saw both. If you're not sure, unknown is one of the, the options. And then how did you identify them? That's the next column. So V is just visual. I just looked at it and knew what it was. C is captured. I got a net on it. I looked at it in hand. P is I took a photo. Um, you may have a combination of these, but I strongly encourage you, even after you're really certain of your identification for some, you know, different species, if you can, please take a photo. It's a permanent record. Um, and, you know, if you're like, oh my God, I know these are Pacific Fork Tales. I have seen 5,000 of them already. Just snap one photo. You know, even if you saw males and females and tenor adults and mating pairs and tana pairs and ovipositing, just one photo as a record for that specific species, okay? 
And then for abundance, you can record like the numbers that you're seeing, but for ease of reporting, what we are recording is like abundance categories. So if you only see a handful, one to four individuals in your entire survey of a particular species, the category is uncommon. It was there, but there weren't very many of them. If you're doing your counts and you see more like a few dozen, five to 20, it occurred frequently. So F category. If you're seeing up into you know, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, common, that's the category. And if you're like, oh my God, there are so many, there, there's like too many of these to count. This is ridiculous. Well, they're super abundant. And these abundance levels will change for the different species during the year. So use hash marks, tick marks on the data sheet or in a notebook, that's fine too, to record you know, how many of each of the different species you're seeing. But in the end, what you'll be reporting are those abundance categories. And as well, if you see newly emerged 10 -year -old adults, if you see females laying eggs, tandem pairs, individuals in the wheel that are mating, any or all of those for each of the different species that you see, record those as well. Because the reproductive behaviors are important. If we see a newly emerged adult, we know the chances are pretty good. It developed as an egg and a nymph in that particular site. If we see a female is laying eggs, well, yeah, we know they're breeding at the site. So it gives us some additional life history information. So the data is going to be recorded in a dedicated project site on iNaturalist. And I know for some people, this website, and it's also an app, is going to be a little bit novel. So I am gonna real quick stop sharing my slides and pull up iNaturalist and walk through how you would do your data reporting when you have collected data from a survey. So let me bring that up and go back to screen sharing. There we go. So some of you may be familiar with um, iNaturalist. It's basically, well, it's basically sort of a community science uh, project to record any type of life form on the entire planet, which sounds very broad and nonspecific. Um, but the data are all freely available and they are used by a variety of different scientists and academics and people who write guidebooks and people that are looking for new species records or describing new species. Um, it's very accessible, it's very inclusive. So I'm gonna run through how you would, you go out in the field, you've recorded everything on your data sheet. How do you submit this data to the project? Step one, go to inaturalist.org. That's the website. Um, as you will see, there are also free app for Android um, and for iOS platforms. So if you're more comfortable taking photos and using your phone, you can report the data right there in the field. If you do not yet have, and, and you are everybody seeing this, right, Tiffany? Yeah, it looks great. Cool. If you don't have an account yet, sign up, free account, username and password. Obviously, I have an account, so I'm gonna log in. All right, so I have been using this for some time. I just hit my thousandth record a couple of days ago. What you are gonna to wanna to do after you create your account is you're going to wanna to go over here to the community tab. And so you can see it says people, you can search for users, projects, journal posts, and forum. And this down here shows you the projects that you actually have signed on to. You can see that I'm on quite a few. This particular project is called Dragonfly surveys in Johnson Creek. Now, none of you are members of that project yet. So all you have to do is type dragonfly surveys in Johnson Creek into the search box. It will bring up the project and there'll be a big button that says, join this project. And that's what you will click on to join the project. And again, the steps for how to do this are in the slides, which I know you have a handout version available to you and it is in the monitoring protocol manual. So dragonfly surveys in Johnson Creek. Here's the name. There's a button that you can click here to add observations to the project and you get some quick stats. So there have been over a thousand observations reported since this uh, project began. We have reported 31 species and 39 people have done the reporting. And then there's like 
who's reported the most observations, who's seen the most species, what species are observed the most commonly, specific fork tail and two we blew it for the damsels, common white tail, cardinal meadowhawk, and common green darner for the dragons. And it shows you the three spots in the county where our monitoring sites are located. So you can click on any of these individual observations and it will bring them up either as a grid from left to right. You can see that some, this California darner, that was me. Um, I didn't manage to get a photo of it, but I knew what it was so confidently, so I reported it. Others, even though these are common species, as I said, I still like to do at least one photo for every species that I report. And you can also take a look at where they're located on the map, or you can put them in list form, and then you can see who, who reported it, what date it was observed, where it was found at, okay? But let's say that I want to go back. I've done a survey and I wanna report my data. So what you will do is you will have one member of your team who is the designated reporter. It doesn't have to be the same person the entire season, but before you leave the site, be like, yeah, Julia, you're the one who's going to report the data. You're going to upload the data, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if any photos were taken, obviously, that Julia, for example, does not have in hand, well, get them to her, right? So that she can, she can upload them because we like to see the photos. And once you click on add observations to this project, you will see the top part of the screen that comes up is standard for absolutely any observation you would ever report on iNaturalist. This is their, their baseline, right? So what did you see? Let's say that the first species I saw was a cardinal meadowhawk. You can see that as soon as I start to type in the common name, various things that might match it come up. So I can keep typing. And there's cardinal meadowhawk. The reason that they have these drop down menus is to prevent people from putting in something that's misspelled. Okay. Then the next thing below that is when did you see it? Now, let's say I saw one a couple days ago. So make sure you put in the date. Uh, there's a note section here. So if you have anything to mention, like the water levels were really high, the wetland was starting to dry out, it was full of fish, like whatever was relevant, you know, go ahead and report that. Where were you? Very, very important. So let's say that I was at Westmoreland Park. This is searchable. So if I hit return on Westmoreland Park, oh, a Google map comes up. I can zoom out. I do believe that it's not in the correct state. Let's at least let it know that it's Portland, Oregon. Try that again. There we go. And it just puts a dot in the center of the location. You're like, well, actually, I was more over here. Do not worry about the fact that you saw species in different places as you were moving around. Just, you know, pop the pop the point in the center of wherever you were you were searching and then once you drop that point, you can just leave it. You can add photos. So, um, if you've got them on your hard drive or if they're stored in a Google Photos photo, uh, folder and then you can just choose files and so you click on that and it'll go to your your finder and you can put whatever, whatever photos in that you have. If you scroll down now past that information to the lower part of the page, every single one of these fields is exactly the same as your data sheet. The observers, when did you start? And you can fill that in, you can drag. We started at 4.06 p.m. We ended at 6 p.m., right? The temperature, and we do report it in degrees Fahrenheit. Calm, light, moderate, or strong winds. Fill in whatever your proportion of cloud cover was. That's a percent. Again, any notes, you know, maybe, maybe the category is uncommon, but you want to specify, oh, we only saw one. We only saw one individual. And here's where you say, oh, I saw males and I saw females, okay? And if you didn't know, unknown. How did, whoops, how did you identify? And again, you've got your reminder here, record all that apply, visual, captured, or photo. Well, I looked at it and I took a photo and here's your abundance categories. Obviously you won't be reporting none. Was it that one to four uncommon, five to 20 frequent, 
21 to 100 common or a whole lot abundant. And any of the reproductive stages that you saw. So maybe you saw mating pairs in wheel and tandem pairs and they were ovipositing. And there might be times when you don't see any of that. You're like, well, I just saw some males flying around. You might, there might be times where you leave that blank, but any of those behaviors that you do see, you're gonna record. Now, you will have to fill in even the repeated information like the observer names and the start and stop time and all this top part repeatedly. Uh, there's no way because this is something specific that we designed, it's not part of the default iNaturalist um, data reporting. Um, there's no way for us to automate that. I did check with the developers. But um, as I said, you're never going to have more than about 10, 11, 12 records. So it's, it's a little bit of a pain to have to keep on re-entering that, but it's not terrible. If all you saw, if all I saw was just that cardinal meadowhawk, that was the only species I saw, I can just do save observation. But if you don't want to have to add in the date, the location, again, just hit save and add another. And the screen that comes up, and I don't want to hit save and add another because I don't want to have a false record. The screen that comes up will automatically still have the same date and the same location. And then you put in what you saw, add any photos that you have. Um, and you can do that as many times for as many creatures as you have. So let me bring my slides back up again and do share. And the step-by-step the -step instructions for this are, um, as I said, in the manual. And this is back to the slide presentation. This is basically walking you through exactly what I just did live. Okay, um, so you can refer back to this in the handout version of the presentation that you have. But one thing I want to stress is this. One date, one species is a single record. I've had people get a little confused sometimes and they'll, they'll report the male Pacific fork tails that they saw. And then as a separate record, they'll report the female Pacific fork tails that they saw. One species and their abundance, male, female, unknown, any reproductive stages, anything like that, one date, one species is a single record reported, okay? And if you're not sure of the ID, um, you know, you can even put in unknown. You can put in dragonfly, damselfly, skimmer. And iNaturalist uses a crowdsourcing identification and other users, you're gonna see that your, your records go from being, um, uh, it's called, I can't remember what the name of it is before it gets confirmed, um, but it'll go to research grades. You see there's this data quality assessment and now this is research. So this is a common white tail. Um, I submitted it. This is my ID, common white tail. Yeah. One of the other users came in and confirmed, yeah, it's common white tail, right? Um, I am going to be looking at your records and this way, if I if there's an identification that was a mistake, um, or if uh, if I have any questions about the the data, maybe you forgot to put in the abundance category or something, I can look at it and get back to you pretty quickly um, while the memory of that survey is still fresh in your in your mind. Um, so and, and don't you know, like don't be afraid to go out on a limb and say, well, I think this is a two of the buoy, but I'm not sure. I don't want to be wrong. It's fine if you're wrong. I mean, it's a learning experience. And again, you know, people aren't mean on this. They're they just more sort of compete with each other to be the first one to get to that species ID and do the confirming or do the correcting. And while you're on the INAT site, if you're if you're confused and you need more help, um, there is a more tab at the top of the page, and there's tutorial videos and. FAQs with answers, they provide a lot of support. It really is pretty user friendly if you've never used it before. As I said, there's a free app. You would log into the app with the same username and password um, and you just have to add the project. Make sure you're, you've joined the, the Dragonfly project already on the, on the desktop and then you can add that. And then if you wanna take photos with your phone and upload the report the observations in the field, you can, you can do that as well, whatever you're most, whatever you're most comfortable with, whatever works. Um, and with that, um, I know I'm a little bit over time, but I will turn it over to Tiffany again. Um, and she is gonna go through more of those logistics.
Great, thank you. Um, by the way, I just want to say a big thanks because that's the last we love working with you and just like so much wealth of information. We're going to learn more when we're in the field with you, but I just want to say preliminarily pre thank you, I guess. So with that, I'm going to go ahead, share my screen. And what I'm going to do right now pretty quickly here as we're finishing up is really just cover the logistics, like signing up for your surveys, getting your gear, all of those things. So yeah, let me present this now. Um, I'm going to skip through a few things here. Um, so the things we're going to do is the online resources, our website, and then how you're getting gear. It's a little bit different this year. We're going to do all of the gear. Um, today, when you go to the orientation in person at Westmoreland Park, you're going to get your net and the handouts that you need. And that's what you're going to have for the whole season. We're doing things differently because of COVID and the risk of transmission from passing materials around uh, week by week and the need for sterilization, a lot of factors there. Um, so the main thing is that we're providing a lot of online resources and we're doing, you know, minimal in person. The net you have, you'll keep for the season and then at the end of the season, you'll return. So, yeah, we'll go through that. Um, so this is going to be mostly actually we'll probably need to switch this share. Let's see. Can you guys see a new screen or are we still looking at a presentation, Celeste? I am looking at your screen showing the volunteer waiver. Great. Okay, cool. Just want to confirm. Thanks. So what you're going to do, I'm actually going to send everyone this link in a little bit, is you're going to go through here and you're going to write in all of your information for this waiver. You're going to click submit. And when you get to the submit page, it will then provide you with a link. Uh, hang on. i got to move something. This is the challenge. It's then going to provide you with a link that you're going to be able to get to um, get to this toolkit right here. So once you have that link, it's going to say thank you, we've got your waiver, and you can copy it, put it in your browser, and it's going to send you here. And then you're going to be able to actually go through and write down your name and sign up for a survey. And the way that we're doing the surveys is we've got them set up Saturdays every other week. And um, you're going to go through, right, like, let's say I want to do the 3rd, July 3rd. I might write, you know, my name. Um, and for now, we're going to have people sign up for two to three surveys, and then you can sign up for as many substitute roles as you want. And then after everyone's gotten a chance to at least do two to three, then if people want to do more, we can open that up. But I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to sign up for some things. So I sign up for one, I sign up for another one there. And then on that, if you just look over the substitute sections here, up to four people can sign up per survey. Um, and the nice thing about that is if for some reason you can't make your survey date, there's three other people that person can survey with, and there's a substitute that can be called. So that's why we want to kind of fill those up. Um, and then moving over, so contact information, if you have questions, you could always call me here. The best way to reach me right now is actually via email. This is mostly because of COVID, we're working remotely, but I will check my phone line at least once a day. I try and check it at the beginning or at the end of the day to catch people. And I'm going to add everyone else's personal information, not anything that you don't want to share. I'm not going to put your phone number but I'll put your email so people can reach you if there's an issue with surveys and like trying to connect with time with you. You're gonna select the time of day that you're surveying with your team. Um, if you'd like to add your phone, if that's the best way to contact you, you can add the phone number and you can say the best way you wanna be reached. Like I don't wanna put people's phone number if that's not information they want out there. Okay, and then the next thing that I wanted to show you all is resources. So Celeste has mentioned so many incredible resources so far. And the thing is, you wanna know, well, how do I get to these links? Uh, first thing, you go here to this page, it tells you, first you're gonna confirm your survey date and time. And you can do that by going back to the first tab. The next is like, with your team, get. I'm gonna start an email with you the week before saying, hey, your survey is coming up. And everyone's gonna be on that email and you can say, you know, I'll sit, like suggest a time or I'll have people just pick a time that looks good because depending on the day, if it's 95, you're gonna need to go at 10 a.m. I'm not gonna really preset a time because the date's gonna be different. Um, and then this is actually something that is different. So this year, we don't need to be doing the gear pickup and transport as a team because you're getting all your gear today and you're gonna drop it off at the end of the season. So it's one less thing to coordinate. And you're gonna figure out who's gonna upload the the all of the data onto iNaturalist and then who's going to update this spreadsheet. So like after your survey, you go and say date survey, you write the date, hours surveyed. If you don't know this, don't worry, but if you do know it, fill it in. Um, I will come in and fill in whatever I have questions on. If you entered into iNaturalist, after uh, you finish your iNaturalist entering, write your name and the date you entered it and any notes you have to add. Um, and that's one thing that like 
something weird happened on your survey, you can add it here. And then the next time someone goes to say Brookside or the next site, then they're aware. Um, I'm gonna kind of go through the rest of this a little quick because we're we're getting close to our noon time. We might be a few minutes over. I just wanna give people a heads up. I'm gonna try and finish this by 1210. Okay, and so at that point, you've got your spreadsheet, you put your info on iNaturalist. Uh, the gear you're gonna get today, it's gonna be a dragonfly net and paper data sheets. And it's gonna come with like a, a color version of the families, uh, the most common species, your data sheet, and then a net. Um, your other things that you're gonna need to bring, water bottle, snacks, your phone or camera, backpack, gear for the weather. The things we're providing is data sheets and uh, nets. And this is something that's also different for this year. I think I'm on, I'm sorry for this version. I may be on this wrong version. We're not gonna be providing a book this year because of COVID. But what we're doing is giving people lots of links to download apps and information to purchase a field guide if you'd like to have one for your site. Uh, maps and directions to site, I'm going to email you that the week of your survey. Optional stuff, you can bring a field guide and binoculars. Um, and then, yeah, once again, after your survey, we covered this information. A few what ifs. What if you can't survey for the date? Um, contact the substitute on that list. Take your name off of the survey date and let me know. What if you can't get in touch with your partner? Try and contact them whatever way you can. Uh, get to contact the substitute, update me. And then we're gonna be returning all of the gear after the season's fully over, October 4th through 8th at the Watershed Council. And I'm gonna send you an email like with certain times and days you can drop it off and make sure something works for everyone. And then these are all of the links that Celeste talked about. So uh, Odonata Central, the phone app, Dragonfly ID app, um, all of these different apps and links are all right here. Also, you can feel free to add at the bottom. If you have really cool resources you've seen online, you could add them here. Celeste can go in later and add stuff. If there's things that you've seen that you want to add in. Um, and yeah, that's kind of the main thing I wanted to show you on there. So we did waivers, spreadsheets. Um, the website is the next thing I'm going to show you now. Um, so on our website, there's also a lot of really good information that's gonna cover any questions you have. So right here, monitoring protocol, again, this is here. The, vo the volunteer manual, if you click this, you're gonna be downloading the whole PDF that Celeste showed. It's like 20 pages about, it's got so much detail. Any questions you might have a review of what Celeste has shared is in there. Uh, Dragonfly facts checklist is on there too, and that helps answer some what if questions and things you need. Uh, quick guide to families, you're gonna get this in a paper form as well as the data sheet today. But if you wanna have another look at it or if you lost your paper data sheet or lost one of those papers, it's right here. Um, and then site directions, they're also downloadable from here for each site. And I'll also email them to you as well. And then this list of the species in Multnomah County, also here for a link. This, you're gonna get this today in person with the data sheet. And then this is the presentation Celeste just shared in PDF form is there's a link here. And there's a presentation that I'm sharing now is actually available online too, if you need to review it. And I'm also gonna add a recording of today's session at the end. Um, so if you wanna go back through this virtual session to rewatch parts, that'll be available there. And then there's a reminder, Naturalist project name, the link for it, the project list. And if you have, um, you're finished with your time or you have feedback, we'd love to have your volunteer survey information. And the last thing here is if you want to know what happened in 2016, 2018, uh, 2019, you want to look at the full data reports from the past, you'll click the Dragonfly Science and Full Data uh, data page, and you can scroll down. There's like a little review of damselflies, dragonflies, some quick facts, survey methods, how the survey is conducted, results from the past. And then from here, this goes into like, I'm not going to click on these or spend much time, but each year, there's a full report that you can download and read so much more information on if you would like to get more detail on past years. Um, so with that, let me see if there's much more on here. Yeah, so this um, this is a reminder. I kind of I've covered this already. We do emails, the, the partner information, substitute, and you guys can figure out transport with COVID. I'm recommending that people meet on site so they're all outdoors. And the biggest thing is also if you're a survey partner, you need to check in with each other. You're going to assume that masks is the default. If people communicate with each other and all agree that they're vaccinated and they're okay with taking their mask off, every single person on that team feels that way. And you're not, you know, encroaching on the public in a public space where you're really close to people. That's up to you. But we really want to be mindful of the public spaces we're in 
and very respectful of our survey partners. You know, they don't even have to share their vaccination status. They just say, no, I don't want to, I want to keep my mask on. We just need to be respectful and assuming mask on is the default. Uh, the gear, I've covered this. You're going to be getting your data sheets. And then today, it's really important that you show up and meet us at the park because that's where you're going to get your net, your paper data sheet when we meet at Westmoreland Park. Um, and at the end of the season, we're going to be dropping off. We actually rent out a church, not affiliated, um, but we rent out a space there. So uh, you have to ring the doorbell. I'm going to send you a whole follow-up email with drop-off instructions, but it's going to be in October. If for some reason you need to stop surveying sooner and you no longer want to hold on the net uh, up until then, you can let me know and I can arrange something before then. But for ease of like return, I'm going to try and do all of them that week. Great. And then we kind of, you know, we covered this, your survey week, you're going to make sure you feel well, you have the information, you're checking that spreadsheet for your next date. Uh, Celeste went over this. And then these directions are pretty self-explanatory, but the main thing I wanted to share is that Brookside Wetlands is definitely in, a, in the main public space. And there sometimes can be folks camping or who are houseless in those spaces. We want to respect their space, leave them alone and avoid all conflict. We're not here to enforce any rules or tell anyone what to do at all. We're really just here to look at dragonflies and damselflies and collect those. And if you're getting close to someone's space and you're uncomfortable, just leave immediately. Um, Westmoreland Park is in the public eye as well. Most of the time, people might just ask you what you're doing and be intrigued. If someone does say, hey, what are you doing near the water area behind the fence? You can let them know. I work with Watershed, Johnson Creek Watershed Council. They've connected with local authorities. I'm allowed to be here. If anyone gives you a problem, you can have them contact us. Or if there's any ever, ever a conflict at all, just de 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 leave, de-escalate, leave. This is very unlikely. Most of the time, people just want to say hi and ask what you're doing. Um, Centennial Pond, I just wanted to give a small note. This is at a, a private site that we're working with a school district to uh, do restoration on. And so it's only weekends we can go there. And we're going to be parking behind that white truck um, over here. And then there's actually an opening in the gate uh, right where this arrow is. Um, normally, we don't want people parking uh, next to the Grange area uh, because that's their area. We don't want to park in uh, business that we're not going to. And yeah, Celeste, it looks like you have a question. Is that still the case that Centennial is under construction? Because I didn't think there was going to be more. Is there new work being done there this season? Yeah, work is continuing at this point. It's mostly planting. So we're not doing like major construction, but it's not necessarily an open public site. Like people can't go there for just a walk, essentially. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, great. And then for the rest of this, these are your transects you're going to walk. Um, and the what ifs, I'm actually just going to pass this stuff. I've kind of talked over it. And if you have questions, let me know. And I'm sending these out as resources. I'm going to skip a few things. Um, yeah, so final notes. Yeah, I talked about this COVID-19. Sites are marshy. If you don't have boots, you want boots for a site, let me know well in advance. I could try and get you some shoes that you could wear. Otherwise, um, any kind of muck boot is great. And depending on the weather, it will be different on your site, but you're near the water um, edge for your transect. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and kind of wrap up and just see if folks have any questions. I know I covered things a little bit quickly, and I'm going to actually share some of these links that I've been talking about. So, um, Tiffany, I was kind of uh, monitoring the question box as you were talking, and there was one question that was asked um, that is uh, an excellent one. Um, and by the way, these are like super resources. This is so organized. And like I said, you know, you folks may be feeling a little overwhelmed now, but just take some time to explore everything that Tiffany has put together because this is really, really a nice toolbox. So greatly, greatly appreciate it. One person did ask if there's a way to be sure that um, if you are a newbie that you're going out on a team that has an experienced surveyor. And I know that in the past, we tried to have like peer mentor surveyors because we do have folks that are returning. I don't, I don't know if you have like a mechanism for that or if there's a way to identify that or I don't know, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, that's a great thought. And this is something that's come up on other surveys. I think one thing we could do for now, when you put your name down on a survey, um, I'm gonna put a little key, I'll change the sheet now that says like, if you're new, we're gonna put an N like in parentheses at the end of your name. If you're an experienced survey, we'll put an E for experienced surveyor. And for the best that we can, we're going to, you know, try and match yourself up with someone. There's four people on that survey. If you see an experienced surveyor and you're new, go for one of those. Um, but I think that there may occasionally be teams that don't have the experienced surveyors just because of the season and people turnover. And in that case, 
double check a lot of your info, contact me with questions, rewatch some of the videos. And just remember that the biggest piece of this is doing the best that you can safely and slowly. And don't feel like you have to know every single dragonfly or damselfly. Like I went out surveying last year before I had the training from Celeste, And I just was like, okay, I knew how to handle them carefully. And then I took the photo and then the ID happened way later. So don't stress that piece too much. Um, and I just wanted to share, I did pop in the chat box, the waiver. And when you complete your waiver at the end in the confirmation is the link to the spreadsheet with your ability to sign up. I'm also going to follow up with an email after this virtual portion. I recommend you sign up today after the virtual portion ends. We're going to be ending in a few minutes here between now and then the in-person, because then if something comes up, I can help you when I see you at 1.30 today. So I guess um, the one thing I want to kind of close up with here is please, please, please. We're so excited to meet you. Masks on, required. We're going to be at Westmoreland Park. Come see us there, 1.30 to 3.30. You're going to get your net, your paper data sheets. Celeste is going to cover some key techniques. Even though you're, we're not going to see dragonflies because of the rain, you never know. And also, if there's a certain type of way to you move around the net and do certain techniques that's going to be really important that you're learning in person today. And it's where you get your, your materials. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Look for a follow-up email from me in the next 10 minutes with your link. I also put it in the chat. Um, and I think with that, we're going to have to close this up. There were a few other, oh yeah, go for it, Celeste. Two quick things. Number one is, I just put my email into the chat box throughout the season. If you have questions, if you are having trouble learning something or figuring something out, reach out to me. That is part of the work that I am doing for the Watershed Council. And the second thing is, if you have time over lunch, um, you might want to download the Dragonfly ID app and or um, the iNaturalist app to your phone. Thank you for saying that. I'm actually going to follow up with you guys with an email with those links. And it's also in the spreadsheet under resources. I put all those links on there. So there's so many ways to get that. But please do that before you show up today if you have a chance. I'm actually going to download them right now. So I'm glad you invited me. Okay, so with that, I'll see you guys later. We're going to end the virtual portion. We're going to see you in real life, actually, with masks on in Westmoreland Park. Um, we're going to meet near the nature play area. It's also close to the restrooms. I'm going to have a sign out says Johnson Creek event, and it's going to be pointing that way. You'll see me. I'm going to have a bunch of nets. It'll be hard to miss. Uh, bring your rain gear. Uh, we will do as much as we can with whatever the weather gives us, and I will see you all later. I'm excited to see you in person at 1.30. Okay. See you soon. Bye.